go forward for your next truck or SUV and find an easier way to buy with Woodhouse Ford today and experience the convenience of buying with Woodhouse Ford. Save up to $13,000 off MSRP on a 2023 Ford F-150 XLT plus 3.9% APR for 60 months with approved credit. $299 dock fee to at signing. Security deposit waive expires 1-02-2024. The South Dakota Stories, Volume 4. I remember wondering why I'd ever visit South Dakota in the winter. But then again, why hadn't I? There was so much wilderness to explore. So many ways to restore my soul. And so many landscapes that put a smile on my chilly face. So why would I visit South Dakota in the winter? Because this is where winter was meant to be. There's so much South Dakota. So little time. Welcome friends, it's the Movie Boom Podcast. Podcast, enjoy the show. Zachy and Welcome to a movie film commentary track. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm here with Brian Hall. Hey, good morning, Zaki. Good morning. This year, Brian, is the 25th anniversary of one of our favorite movies. That's right. Jurassic Park. Where? How old were you when Jurassic Park came out? Uh, 13. I was, I was also 13. Wait, you and I are the same age. Yeah, I always thought you were a year older than me, but I think there's just a little overlap underlap whatever it is with months we have like a five month window there where i get i get to be older than you and i get to lord it over you (laughs) and he does and and, uh, constantly for for no reason at all (laughs) uh like when we're out to lunch i'll be like you pay because i'm older than you (laughs) (laughs) yeah Yeah. uh but yeah no jurassic park we were were both 13 it came out the summer of 93 and and what a time it was you know i think i think for me the, the affinity i have for this movie is is both because it is just such a damn good movie. Uh, yeah, uh, but also because it takes us back to that magical time when when we we just believed that dinosaurs were walking once again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll get into that more. This was definitely a very top five, probably movie going theater going experience for me. And I think what you are saying is is the case for for many many kids who who got to be kids when when this movie came out yeah exactly but i think honestly uh, a lot of adults got to be kids when this movie came out too yeah yeah i would imagine you know and i i think that's that's really the sweet spot that steven spielberg hit with this film so so this has been a commentary track long in coming it's been not 65 million years <laughs> in, in in the making but but uh it feels like it because when when we first started doing commentaries uh, about four years ago now that this was one where i was like man 25th anniversary of jurassic park <laughs> so it's like the countdown has been on you know yeah, uh, but here we are. We're just a few days away from Jurassic World: Fallen Kingdom. Neither you nor I have seen it. I have, right. however, just wrapped a multi-week uh, revisitation of the entire Jurassic uh, franchise with my kids. So I'm 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 perfectly situated. I'm in the exact right headspace to talk through this movie with you. And and Brian, we've never watched this together. Wow, how can that be? If that's the truth. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so this is going to be fun. So, so we've got it queued up. There is only one cut of Jurassic Park. Okay, you know, Steven Spielberg doesn't do director's cuts. No, right. No. That's the that's what that's the advantage of. Being well, Steven wait, Spielberg. hold on. Uh, Close Encounters. Touche. Okay, uh, but that's the o- the only one I can think of. And 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 that's valid. And it tells you who Steven Spielberg was at that stage in his career. Yeah, yeah. But post. Close Encounters, Steven, the theatrical cut is the Steven Spielberg director's cut. Yes. Right? Yes. Because which studio executive is going to tell Steven Spielberg to, to make cuts? Right. Right. So not this so, guy. Uh, sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> I just said, not this guy. Not, it, I, that's I true. So, so we have the only cut of Jurassic Park queued up and ready to go. We are past the FBI warning and the rating screen. We are in the black just before the classic Universal logo, it's there ready to play. So if you want to watch along with us, please do. You're certainly welcome to do that. We will, as is our tradition with these commentaries, we'll try to keep the conversation uh, lively enough that if you are just listening as, as you're driving or exercising or whatever, hopefully that keeps you going too. Yeah. So uh, I'm queued up and ready, Brian. Uh, we will play on three. One, two, three, play. Okay. 
and here we go. One, two, three, play. All I think right. I've gotten you know, better with that, Brian. Yeah, no, I think it's great. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> and then also, I, I have this weird thing, uh, just a little peek behind the curtain. I play it on my PlayStation 3, and then sometimes during the build-up while we're, before we start the film, it'll go into like a what do you call it? Like a screensaver? And I'm like, no, no, no. And then I have to undo it. And then I, <laughs> so it becomes this, I try to play it cool, but I, uh, I'm really freaking out over here. Um, it's funny you mentioned the, uh, 65 million years in the making, because that's one of the few poster taglines that I feel like I can remember to this day. That's true. You know, that doesn't seem to happen. An adventure, 65 certain ones. million years in the making. Yeah, and the mere fact, yeah. by the way, Brian, that it was pitched as an adventure really shows Steven Spielberg's farsightedness and how he approached this property. I mean, uh, if you've read the book, the Michael Crichton book, it is ex- it's it's a horror book, right? And and uh, you know, I remember hearing about the book like back in back in ninety or ninety one when when it first came out, when it was first announced, and and almost right away it was like, oh, Steven Spielberg's making the movie. Mm-hmm. Yes. And like, oh, Spielberg's making a movie about dinosaurs. Of course, I'm I'm interested. But but what I uh, find fascinating is that Jim Cameron, when he first heard about it, he wanted to get the rights. Yeah, understandable. And and it was literally he was like, oh, Steven's got it. Oh, okay. And and Cameron has said that had he made it, he would have made Aliens with dinosaurs. Yes, and and said that he thought now in hindsight that that would have been unfair to children because dinosaurs are inherently. For kids and the you know kids at heart, and so so really, Steven Spielberg was the only man who could make this movie. I yes, I agree. You know, and and I, you know, you've heard me talk enough about how much my my oldest boy just adores this movie, and he knows we, it front, yeah. back, and sideways. I mean, he and 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 to me, he was six years old when I took him to the twenty fifth twentieth anniversary wow. screening, and which again I've said before, maybe he was a little young. But I wanted him to have the experience of seeing Jurassic Park on the big screen. I wanted that to be oh, his, his first experience. And and I mean, it's for for him, it's just part of his his DNA, no pun intended. Mm-hmm. Uh, but let's look at this opening sequence here. We got we got Bob Peck as Muldoon, who I love this character. So great, and he's so not over explained. Yeah, right. He just is, <laughs> and 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 that's like the best. That's how, why he is as cool as he is. Yeah, and and this sequence is great because because what what Spielberg realizes is he needs to tease us as long as possible. So we get this shot of like an eye, and we you know, and and mm-hmm. it's just we need to play that thread out because that I, I mean I mean you know if you like permit me to use metaphor, he needs to kind of stroke us a little bit. Yeah, so no, that, it's true though, and it's so it's it's this is a horror film what we're watching right now. Yeah, where we don't even see what's happening. He, this guy is pulled by some force off screen. It's it's I, oh gosh, this I mean, talk about being like you know a kid and seeing this. This was just like, and it, it's all implication. We're not seeing him being torn to pieces by the raptor. No. no. Yeah, look at this. Look at this close up on the mouth, and then like the hand slipping through his arm. That's it's, all we get. It's, it's just still horrifying. It's a. Sp- Spielbergian opening. I mean, it's just, yeah. it, I mean, you know, anyone who listens to our commentaries knows that whenever we watch a Spielberg movie, it's just us gushing over this guy. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, you know what you're getting from us, you know? We, I was going to say, steady yourselves. <laughs> we're just getting started. <laughs> like, like, you know the score with us. This is what we do. But, but, I mean, damn, look at, look at this. That's so perfect. The way his, his hand is just slowly disappearing in there. So perfect. Yeah. And, and it just, it sets the right tone of, of, of fright and mystery and and wonder because because we are being prevented from seeing what what the deal is here you know yeah and then also uh, I mean we're gonna get to this at some point but John Williams you know I mean this is one of his most iconic scores and uh, there's in the hands of other people there would have been maybe more menace or there would have been more this or less that and then he. Just what what he does is, like you said, where this movie is an adventure. Like this is, uh, he gets tense when it needs to be tense, but this is always still something that we're supposed to be like munching popcorn through and That's having right. a good time, you know. And I, as is the case with every film that he's ever scored, I truly believe this. I mean, he's let's say fifty percent of whatever movie we're watching that he scored. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's interesting because you know you and I were were uh, teenagers when this came out, and so it definitely made a mark on us. But the truth is, it made even more of a mark on people on kids who were like seven, eight. Sure. And, yeah. And I and I my that's my sense just from talking to people who who were younger and just really uh, the the way it just burrowed into their psyches, and and that's the distinction that we got versus this being you know aliens. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, I love Aliens. That's not a knock on Aliens. But when you look at the longevity this movie has had in terms of it being just beloved. Uh, yeah. And, by you the know, people it's, who grew up with it. You're making me realize now because when I saw this, when I was 13, so my brother was like about 10 maybe. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing this at Rice Lake Square. Probably rode our bikes down there to go see it in Donata, Illinois, you know, Wheaton, Illinois. And we were standing in line and I remember my brother actually starting to get scared hmm. before the movie started. Wow. And when people came out of the previous screening, he said, will I be scared to a stranger? <laughs> and I don't think he's ever thought that or felt that, but he was actually getting nervous going in. And I remember, we still, we still remember this. This guy goes, you might. And he just walked away. <laughs> That's and, then Dan, and then this is, I think this is his favorite Spielberg movie. It is. Wow. Which is telling. So yeah. Now, now, uh, look at that! Look yeah. at that intro for Sam Neill as Alan Grant. It's yeah. So perfect, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, now, Steven Spielberg had offered this role to Harrison Ford. Yeah, yeah. Which, which, which you can see that. I mean, you can see a version of that, but it wouldn't be this movie. No, I agree, and I'd heard that before, and was like, "What?" And then when I was, you know, brushing up on this yesterday, I tried to imagine it, and I was thinking of that scene where the kids curl up on him, and he's going to sleep in the tree. I was like, oh, actually, yeah, I can kind of picture that. Uh, I think the but problem... it would have been very different. It, 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 it would have felt like an Indiana Jones variation. Yeah. I mean, I think he's got this sort of standoffish thing that they were going for, and also a guy you could picture out in the desert, well, obviously, digging up things. But at the same time, yeah, he would have felt too roguish, and that's not what you want. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, I... If that version existed, I'm sure we'd like it too. But it's definitely, I feel like Sam Neill is so iconic in this role. Yeah. That it is just hard to think of anybody. And I th- I mean, I think it says something that, that 25 years later, I mean, this is the role that he is most known for. And that's not yeah. a bad thing. I mean, it's not a bad thing to, to be like, that's your that's your calling card role, you know? No, absolutely. And it's 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 cool, too, that Spielberg gets to do this as often as he does, where he gets to cast whoever he feels is best. Yeah. And then, like you said, I mean, then they become, I might not know them from other films, but I know them certainly from these movies. And then, I don't know, you can get lost in that a little bit more, because I didn't know who this guy was when I first saw it. And now he's, you know, he's Dr. Grant to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then also with, uh, what's his name? Hammond. I guess he had, he went out to Sean Connery. Yeah, so so imagine Harrison Ford and Sean Connery in this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just wouldn't have felt right. It, it would take you right out of it. Yeah. Now Laura Dern here was twenty five years old. Wow, isn't that crazy? Like I yeah. just think, I mean, uh, like to to me, Ellie Sattler is uh, older than me. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. that weird phenomenon we talk about where you see something <laughs> at a certain age and then you grow up and surpass these actors in age, but they still feel like quote unquote grown ups to yeah. me. <laughs> like they're older than me. <laughs> and and also, I mean, Laura Dern is uh, like a Highlander or something because she looks exactly the same now as she does in this movie. I mean it's amazing, you know? Yeah. She's never gone away, but she seems to be in a lot of things currently and it makes me really happy. Well her and her uh co star Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, same, huh? Right. Yeah, yeah they kinda had this I mean, yeah, again, they never went away, but it seems like ever they're Definitely in the stage where they are beloved now. Well, I, and I wonder if that is kind of the Jurassic effect, where you have all these yeah. kids who grew up with these movies now making movies. Yeah. And being, you know, I mean, Ryan Johnson is, is like around our age. Yeah, that's right. You, know, so you can see him casting Laura Dern because he liked her in Jurassic Park, you know? Yeah. Now, there is there is fan canon that says that this kid grows up to be Owen Grady. Right, right. Which, which I kind of like that, to be honest. I think sure. that's fun, you know? That, that he's, it, he's got the spunky attitude, yeah. Well, and, and the fact that, like, Alan Grant put the fear of raptors into him, and he grows up to and he respects him, you know? 
Actually, I like that quite a bit. That's one of those things, you know, where people are like, does everyone have to be connected in the universe in sequels? But yeah, I'd be okay with that one. I would be, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, now, right here, we get the, the, the entirety of Alan Grant's arc. He doesn't like kids. He's going to like kids by the end. It's, it's such yeah. a Spielberg, you know, it's a, it's a Spielberg arc. Yeah, absolutely. And it totally works. Um, wait, what, what are you seeing on screen right now? Uh, the, the, the helicopter coming down. Okay. Tell me when he goes into the cabin or the trailer. Okay. I think it might be slightly off. I'd rather adjust it. This is too important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're running in. He's Do the laundry. And he is opening the door and he's in the trailer now. Perfect. Hey, we're in sync. Champagne pop? <laughs> there you go. Good timing. Perfect. Where's the day? I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> See, so, you know, that's, that reminds me. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I, I, you know, Richard Attenborough playing John Hammond makes the character just so lovable that it removes yes. him from, from being sort of the uh, kind of a darker character that he is in the book and who dies in a pretty graphic way. Because he's he's so lovable. Look at him. Oh, he's all smiling and he's happy. You know, come on. Yeah. He's everyone's grandpa, you know? Yeah, and it's funny. You're right, because you should really... He's responsible for so much death. Yeah. <laughs> you know, by the end of this film. And at the same time, you know, you're still... I don't know, have twinges of sympathy for him. And even when you see him again in the second one, you're like, hey, hey that guy. That guy, you know? yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so Richard Attenborough, who directed the film Gandhi, which beat E.T. for Best Picture. That's right. Uh, and then Spielberg was like, oh yeah, well, I'm going to direct you. <laughs> what do you think of that, dick? <laughs> you can call me uh, Richard. No, dick. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's it's funny because, uh, because as I mentioned, the character of Hammond dies in the book. And and Richard Attenborough gave an interview where he actually said he's like, you know, Stephen uh, took away my my brilliant death scene, uh, hmm. but it, he said, well, you lost your death scene, but you may have gotten a sequel out of it, so it's a fair trade. <laughs> That's funny, and and it's true. I mean, I mean, I, I I again, it really Spielberg's instinct about how to take the book and finesse it and make it something that's screenworthy are are. Uh, you know he 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 doesn't step wrong uh when when it comes to the first Jurassic Park every every single choice he made was a smart one yeah i agree i don't remember the book as well so you'll you'll probably have to comment to that if you do uh but i did read it i it, it, you mentioned that earlier but i this uh i again in my research they spielberg was going to make this movie before it even came out so that's how ahead yeah. of the the curve they were. Like the, this movie, when this book was going to come out, there was al- it was already out to directors. Crichton was already demanding one point five million dollars for the rights. Like it was already a thing. And and Crichton could do that, by the way, because he was yeah. a very well respected writer. Uh, you know, Andromeda Strain, and and uh, uh, um, you know, and obviously he he uh, wrote and directed you know Westworld and Great Train Robbery, etc. So he was he was a known commodity. I mean, nowadays nowadays it's like Michael Crichton, oh Jurassic Park, right? But he was he was very famous before this, right? Right, and apparently he and Spielberg were developing an ER movie, that's which right. then became the TV series. That's right. Yeah, and that's why uh, Spielberg is is a producer uh, for ER. He had yeah. nothing to do with that show, but he was cashing checks from it for 14 years. Can you believe that? I, I just learned the other day that that went into the middle 2000s. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. That's crazy. I just assumed, uh, you know, everyone stopped watching after George Clooney left. Yeah. Because what's the point? <laughs> Dotson. Dotson, we got Dotson here. <laughs> now here's Wayne Knight as Dennis Nedry. Wayne Knight, primarily known as as a comedic actor, although he had been in uh, JFK uh, by Oliver Stone. But I mean, I knew That's him right. as as Newman, as I think most people yeah uh, know him uh, from Seinfeld. But I also uh, the first time I saw him was actually on a sketch comedy show called The Edge, which aired on Fox in summer of '92, which also starred uh, uh, Jennifer Aniston. So that was the first time hmm. I saw Jennifer Aniston was on that. Interesting. This is every scene in this movie is so memorable. <laughs> this whole thing with the uh, the shaving cream can. I, I know you know it's a funny little 
fad going on right now where people make these little lapel pins based on the pop culture stuff we grew up with. Mm -hmm. And one of the most brilliant ones I saw was this shaving cream can, the the Barbasol Barbasol can. can. (laughs) And then you, but it all, you lift it up and it actually has an inside with the uh, little, whatever you want to call it, the DNA vials. That, that, that is the most hipster thing I've ever <laughs> Yeah. That's out no, hipstering no. the hipsters. Yeah. yeah. It's always grossed me out, too, when he puts the shaving cream on the pie. <laughs> I'm like, no, some dude's going to eat that. Somebody's going to eat that. <laughs> now, the, the character of Dotson becomes uh, uh, more prominent. Well, he's, he is more prominent in the book, but he actually comes back in the sequel book, The, the Lost World. Mm. Um, so, so, you know, Crichton had his own plans. I mean, the, the Lost World movie has, has some very... doesn't have much to do with the book. Uh, right. But but Spielberg took sort of the framework of that, which, you know, I mean, that's beyond the scope of this movie. But we'll we'll talk about that a little bit throughout because I, I'm, I'm in, like, a very select fraternity of people that likes the Lost World, uh, Jurassic Park, the, the sequel, uh, the movie sequel, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's fresh in your mind, too. I haven't seen it in several years. Yeah, it's that's that's a commentary that I want to do with you one of these days. All right, yeah, I'll have to revisit that. Now, now here's our introduction to Jeff Goldblum as Ian Malcolm, and I just want to say, right now we're in this we're in sort of this renaissance of of Goldblumia, where <laughs> yeah. everyone just adores Jeff Goldblum, and and I watched this movie in 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 '93, and and I liked everybody, but I was I loved Jeff Goldblum as Ian Malcolm. Yeah, I was like that guy. He is so cool. He's like the cool <laughs> nerd, you know. Yeah. For yeah. the longest time in high school, I wore like a a leather jacket that looked nothing like his, but I was trying to look like Ian Malcolm. Oh, that's funny. You know, and and I, again, I, the 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 cool nerd persona, I just loved it, and I loved how he got so many of the best lines in the movie. So mm-hmm. so when I heard that the sequel was going to be about Ian Malcolm, I was thrilled. Hmm. You know. But I, just, okay, I, yeah. I love his I love his intro here because it's oh and and we should, of course speaking of intro here's Spielberg's uh, the Great Jurassic Park music yeah yeah Ugh. I remember buying this as a cassette single when I was thirteen years old the Jurassic Park theme and I listened to this yeah so was it was it the whole the journey to the island or was it just the the Jurassic Park theme it was the the theme okay and I can't remember what was on the other side but yeah. Yeah, they they just released these movies in 4K, so I've been watching them uh, ah. on on the Ultra HD disc and on on my on my UHD TV, and oh my goodness, Ugh. you really? Oh, I, I, I mean, you feel like that. you're there, you know? Yeah, oh, we should talk about this moment here with the seatbelt. So this is now this is this is fascinating because the whole premise of of chaos is that life finds a way, and the the books are it's the story is that you have all female dinosaurs, how can they reproduce and so we've got Alan Grant here with his, his he's got a defective seat belt where you have two female parts of a seat belt so how how is he supposed to connect it and so what does he end up doing? He ties it together because Brian life, life finds, finds a way. way. <laughs> Brilliant! I I never knew that. I, that was something I discovered on Reddit like four years ago. It was like some thing that suddenly popped up, and I couldn't believe all these years I'd gone by. I never thought about why they spent time on that moment. Isn't that funny? Yeah. I mean, and and that's you know that well obviously they they put that in there for a reason. You know? Yeah, it's brilliant. It is. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm getting lost in this. I know it's, it's <laughs> we're watching it on mute, but but you know this has happened before where I can hear everything. Everything. The score, everything. The dialogue, you name it. Even the background guys. Um <laughs> yeah. The Jurassic Park logo, you could not escape it in summer of Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was everywhere. And I remember people were very critical of this movie for being so blatantly commercial. Uh-huh. Uh, like, oh, it's so, you know, oh, it's just trying to sell things. And, and, you know, we're like the target audience, right? So we're like, no, no, please sell to us. Sell to us. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, dude, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So what I was going to mention earlier was this, I was telling you this before we uh, were recording the other day that this is one of those weird movies. When people ask me to list my top five movies or even my top 10 movies, I never think to name this one. Yeah. But this is truly one of my most like special beloved movies. Yeah. 
So it's kind of funny how, for some reason, I, it doesn't always quickly come to mind. But when I watch it, like this is one of my most comforting meals. You know, it's weird how that works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I'm I'm with you, and I I think that my my love for it has really uh, grown because of my kids' love for it. Oh, interesting. And that's, and I mean, I always, I, I, I'm the same way where it's like, I have my list and then this is a movie I really like. Um, but then it's like, I just see how, how much they're into it. Okay. Hey, we got to look at this right here. Now look yeah. at, look at how he stages this. Look at this. We go in tight and we play the, we play the entire scene off of Sam Neill's reaction here. Look at this. Yeah. And it's all in one shot right here. We go super, he goes right into the camera and he does the thing with the glasses. So yep. perfect. Ugh. <laughs> I don't know, man. I just. Turning her turns head. Yeah, he turns her head. And then the look on her face. Yeah. And this it's got to live up to that now yeah. that I think about it. Exactly. Right. And of course it does. And then right here, the music kicks in. Yeah. And it's, this is movie magic. Because by the time we see that brachiosaur, you believe that it lives and breathes. Yeah. Yeah, and then I was reading, you know, they it was really important to Spielberg that these dinosaurs always be interacting. Sort of like Roger Rabbit, you know? Like, they always interact with something in the actual environment to sort of blend it in. And, and, and I love that shot when uh, Neil falls to his knees and then you see the dinosaurs by the water and you can see the sort of heat ripples yeah. over it. Like, it just completely sells... Yeah, it's it's at. it's a marriage of the practical and the digital. Yeah, and that's one of those things too. I mean, we are definitely do this ourselves, but this is one of those things where people say, "How come the digital effects in Jurassic Park are better than <laughs> they are in the movies now?" Yeah, and it's because this was the perfect blend of practical and digital. Digital when they needed it, and practical when yeah. They did. I, I think people don't realize how much practical there is in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, there's only 16 minutes, I want to say, of actual dinosaurs in this movie. And, <laughs> so, so uh, real quick, actually, Brian, before you... Yeah. That, that shot of Jeff Goldblum that we just saw where he's kind of, like, laughing, he's yeah. talked about how, like, Spielberg was just off camera, and he's like, all right, you're looking, and you're you're laughing for some reason, and he just starts laughing. Okay, now you're, <laughs> you're kind of, you're chuckling. <laughs> like, this is Goldblum doing Spielberg, directing him. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of wonder, too, like, if... Sometimes Spielberg does things like that, but just because he's Spielberg, they're like, uh, sure. <laughs> yeah. You're going to say no to him? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and here's that shot. All right, coming up. There we go. With all the dinosaurs at the water. And here's Great. the crescendo of the music. And then I, I love Grant's line, where the, and just the way he delivers it, where he's like, they're moving in herds. They do move in herds. Yeah. Like, this is the culmination of his life's work, his life's dream. Yeah. You know, and then coming up here in a second, you know, he's like, "How did you do this or pull this off?" And then Hammond's like, "Whispers, I'll show you." Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and the show I work on, you know, every now and then we try to pitch lines for people, and I was like, "Yeah, have the have the little puppy say, I'll show you,' like <laughs> Doctor Hammond from Jurassic Park." And people were like, "What?" <laughs> it's like such a non moment, but so, every moment in this movie is a moment to me. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah. Now, one thing I have said before is would it have been such a bad thing to just make a brachiosaur and pat yourself on the back and be happy? Right, right. <laughs> like, would it be any less impressive? Absolutely. Well, n- n- of course not. But on the other hand, then you're like, but what if you made this? <laughs> right? You'd have to be like, what about a T-Rex? Who That's a T-Rex? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you bred raptors? Oh, gosh. I could quote. That. We should do it. We talk about this sometimes with some of these movies. Do a quote along. track where we're doing all the voices. <laughs> Yeah, but this, so the visitor center, uh, uh, what I love here is that we get such a great sense of the geography of the visitor center that, you know, decades later, when we go back to the visitor center in Jurassic World, Mm -hmm. you know exactly where the characters are, even though it's like a complete desiccated wreck. This is pretty brilliant here, too, where they explain how the science works through this sort of old industrial film. Old yeah, it's, style, it's, it's, film. it's having the character, we, we watch the characters watch a movie about uh, what the hell's going on. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I read in some interview where someone was worried that, 
you know, to Spielberg, like, is this going to be too corny? I think it was the actor playing Mr. DNA. He's like, is this too corny? And he's like, no. And it's funny because it's like, yeah, Mr. DNA. I love that guy. You should <laughs> you be know? like, and that was the first guy who played Mr. DNA. The yeah, second guy right, who played right, Mr. Right. DNA was totally fine with it. <laughs> I don't know. Steven, I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> he's like, is, <laughs> is this a good idea cut to him, like, being shuttled home? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I worked with Spielberg. You know, <laughs> that's his <laughs> takeaway from that. Um, but yeah, this is pretty brilliant, pretty distilled and easy to understand. And I mean, I don't know how it gets much more simpler than this. You know, take the DNA from a mosquito and boom, dinosaurs. And yeah, and, and like when you actually think about it, it is complete argle bargle nonsense. Mm-mm. Like, like, you know what I mean? But they put the veneer of scientific credibility on top of it where you're like, uh, okay, I guess, you know. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I remember back in 93, there was the, the, the old world equivalent of think pieces galore about, like, could it actually happen? Could we actually make Jurassic Park? And Peter Chairman's like, yeah, no, no, that's, no. <laughs> yeah, because apparently DNA only lasts for a certain amount of years, like 500 uh, something crazy. I don't remember. I, uh, was this 65 million years, they, they say? So yeah. it was like, after like 1 million years, like it would be useless or something. Well, and, and not just that. The idea that you would be able to harvest oh, this sure. variety then, of yeah. DNA. You know, what's funny is is that scene where, where, you know, right before they see the dinosaurs, Ellie is looking at that plant and she's like, Alan, this is from the Cretaceous that hasn't been around for... Well, it's like, well, where'd you get that? Like, is, there's no plant DNA. Right, right, right. Like nobody talks about that. Like the plant, the, if a plant goes extinct, it's extinct. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? We don't think about that though. That's pretty funny. <laughs> this reminds me too when it shows the scientist here with the syringe and he's drilling into the amber to the mosquito. Every time I watch this, I'm like, stop, stop, stop! <laughs> I feel like he's gonna go through the, the whole mosquito. <laughs> It's full of holes. I mean, I can hear this whole movie. That's. I mean, it's like I said. I, I just went through the uh, these with the kids, and they've seen them a bunch of times. And and it's. I I just love how they just completely buy into the universe, you know. Mm-hmm. And and like they're they're downstairs right now playing with their Jurassic Park action figures because I just bought them Alan Grant and you know Robert Muldoon, and I got him a T Rex, and they're like, you know. They're, I'm hearing them, and they're like, oh, you know, Ian Mal, we got to go get Ian Malcolm. And, you know, the way they're, <laughs> and I'm like, this is how we were with our Star Wars toys, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I mean, it, it it's weird because I feel like for as successful as this franchise is, I mean, it's a multi billion dollar franchise. It, it, it doesn't get spoken of, uh, for, for the for the massive footprint that it's left like that's that's sort of interesting to me i mean this is for for the generation that grew up with it this is a cherished series mhm mhm uh but you know i mean jurassic park isn't talked about in that way which i find kind of interesting i don't know which well and it, it ties into what i was just saying and i don't know why that is it's almost ubiquitous or something yeah you know but it's like no it's it's really I don't know. I don't know. It's it's easy to I think underappreciate how brilliant it is, and like you say, like it's it's impact. Like it's it's almost like Spielberg is so good at what he does that you almost take it for granted. But like yeah. if you take a step back and really examine, even even watch. There's this shot that I didn't bring up, but where Sam Neill's watching the the film, and then it's like this low angle, and there's a lens flare from the projector coming, and it pushes in on him. And I mean, it's just just that stuff just makes this movie the classic that it is versus just some random movie that came out in 1993. I mean, that's Spielberg just, you know, I think he's, it gets taken for granted sometimes. Yeah. And by the way, here's BD Wong as Dr. Henry Wu, who, uh, ends up becoming a much more central character later on. He's the, he's, uh, somewhat of an antagonist in, uh, Jurassic world and its sequel. Yeah. And I was reading, I guess he gets billed now, in this movie, but he's in it for two minutes. Well, and he thought he was going to be it. in it much more. Really? Well, yeah. Sam Jackson had a similar thing, um, where where he 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 assumed he was going to have a big death scene and whatever, and they just decided not to do it. Just show his arm. <laughs> yeah, because he 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 had said that. I mean, we'll talk about it more, but but he he was supposed to go to Hawaii and have a whole thing with a raptor and everything, and oh. <laughs> he's a little disappointed. You know, that's that uh, reminds me of a lot of the stuff that I read. They were talking about things that Spielberg was coming up with on the fly. And it's kind yeah. of amazing. I mean, one of the biggest ones is 
bringing the T-Rex back in the climax. That's right. I mean, it was just going to be the raptors and the bones falling on them, but he was like, no, 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 the audience will never forgive me if I don't bring the T-Rex back. Yeah. And, and you're and like, well, yeah, it's so powerful. And then his, the banner falling. And I mean, his, just his, his, you know. his storytelling and visual instincts rarely step wrong. Yeah. Especially yeah. during sort of this uh, era of sort of peak Spielberg, as we'd call it. Um, what's interesting to me is that even when this movie came out, there was this sense from from uh, many critics. And I, I don't know if I would say a plurality of critics, but many critics who were like, oh, you know, this isn't as good as like his best stuff. Like he's, sure. this is Spielberg doing Spielberg, like that kind of thing. Right. And. And, you know, I, I guess just the passage of time sort of smooths a lot of those rough edges where we, I mean, I tend to lump this in with his sort of that 80s era. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I mean, this is really, I had a theory and then right before we recorded, I realized it was incorrect, but that this was sort of the end of a phase of Spielberg. Um, and it's not true because the movie, well, Schindler's List came out the same year as this. And we should yeah. talk about that a little bit. But yeah. Uh, I thought then that was sort of the end of Adventure Spielberg, but then of course he made I forgot about Lost World, which came. <laughs> a lot of people I think do. that was his next film, right? He um, went on a little bit of a hiatus and then came out with Lost World, but then he went into Private Ryan. Yeah, know, so, so of, well, so I mean, one could say that uh, we one could mark this as the ending of of of. Uh, uh, that era and lost world is sort of like a tag it on as like an addendum. Sure. But certainly Schindler's list is the beginning of, of, uh, what do you say? Uh, Papa Spielberg, Papa Spielberg. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like, let me tell you a story about history. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Cause you get like Amistad and yeah, yeah, exactly. When was Amistad? That was like 97, wasn't it? Something like that. Or yeah. Right. And then private Ryan was 99 ish or so, eight or private something. Ryan was 98. 98, yeah. Yeah. And then we get into the 2000s and he starts making all this sort of dark, you know, Minority yeah. Report and War of the Worlds. And Even War of the Worlds, yeah, yeah, exactly. You see, bred raptors. See, again, it's like, did, did you need to breed raptors? <laughs> right, right. Now, now I, I think, I, certainly for me, and I'm going to assume for, for most of the world, this movie was the first time we even heard of a velociraptor. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and of course, real for velociraptors look nothing like the ones in this movie. And yet, when we think of velociraptors, we think of we think of this. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and pretty much all dinosaurs, like T Rexes and all that, they don't have that sort of. And I, I read also that uh, dinosaur experts, because I can't think of the official name of what they're actually called, paleontologists. Paleontologists, sure. <laughs> they <laughs> they uh, uh, are not critical, but they sort of snicker at the designs of the dinosaurs in this movie because they basically look like bones with skin they call them like shrink wrap dinosaurs <laughs> which is true yeah i mean it's 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 like a chicken without feathers right yeah 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 which is kind of funny this is a great scene too by the way the feeding you yeah don't i see mean anything but it's still kind of sickening yeah i mean it's it's actually when you, when you think about it it's pretty crazy that we actually don't see the raptors until much much later in the movie yeah, I want to say I read it was 103 minutes in. Isn't that something? But like, yeah. that's like I didn't even realize that. Because no, me neither. They're present, me neither. You know. Yeah, that's a good point because you know you watch some superhero movies and you can feel the running time until you finally see them in their outfit. Yeah, you know. But this is I've never never thought about it with this movie. I just I accept every, you know the pace that it, it gives. It's funny because we ju- we just saw the bit where where they're watching the raptors feed, and again we talk about Spielberg directing. Spielberg was just off camera, uh, and he was kind of in into like a plastic bag. He was going, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> and so they're like reacting to that, and they're trying not to laugh. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh, that reminds me. I was again in. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stop saying in my research. Just just assume anything I say right now is probably from my research. It's not from your ass. It's from your yeah. research. Yeah. Is it true? You bet your ass sick. <laughs> Whoa, that's pretty good. Thank you. Uh, that should be the tagline if we had taglines for our podcast. <laughs> but uh, there, I was surprised, well, maybe not surprised, but as I read more about Spielberg and firsthand accounts, how much improvising he does in his directing on set. And when you were talking about that moment when we first see the characters' reactions to the dinosaurs all on their faces, that was a scene he 
heavily re uh, set up on set. Yeah. So it's just kind of amazing. And then, you know, and then here we are gushing over it. So clearly he saw something while he was there and was like, no, it can be better. Well, and, and what's what's interesting about that, Brian, is that he went into this movie completely uh, uh, locked in as far as storyboards. He had storyboarded every mm. single shot uh, out of necessity because it was so heavily reliant on this new technology that, that nobody knew anything about. And so yeah. he needed every shot to look a certain way. And so I think that when you have that level of preparation where you know what you know what every single shot looks like already, that gives you that gives you the flexibility to say, okay, within this frame that I already know what it looks like, um, you can do this and that. Like he knows what the boundaries are. Yeah. You know? Now yeah. I, I want to uh, acknowledge here uh, one of the great monologues. I think I think Ian Malcolm very much is the voice of Michael Crichton, mm. and he's also the conscience of the film. Uh, and and what he's saying here is is great. I mean it's it's like it's a, a, a timely no matter what genetic power is the most awesome force. You wield it like a kid that found his dad's gun. I mean it's it's you know Ian Malcolm is sort of a light and comedic character, but he's what he's saying here is completely true, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I think, I think Goldblum has this ability to deliver it in a way where he's not weighing the movie down. Right. Uh, but again, he is the conscience of the film. Yeah. And it's, I'm realizing too, cause I don't think about this. I just enjoy this film, but this, you should be thinking as an audience member, like get to the dinosaurs. Right. But you, you're not because this whole debate here is really compelling. Yes. Like you enjoy watching these actors deliver this. That's right. You know? Yeah. And the whole notion of like your scientists were so preoccupied uh, with whether they could, they didn't think about whether they should, you know? Yeah. And then, you know, condors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For right. to make a flock of... It's great. It's a great debate. <laughs> it's a great uh, debate about bio uh, uh, ethics and, and, and things that are entirely relevant. You know, I mean, you know, we we still have conversations about cloning and the ethics of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, too often ethics are left out of the question entirely because it is so much about, oh, well, this is a new thing we can do. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and by the way, I mean, it says something about these characters that decades removed, uh, we still want to see them. Like, you know, I want to see Alan Grant in another Jurassic Park movie. Yeah. I'm ecstatic that we're going to see Ian Malcolm for however brief a role it is in the, in, in this next one. Yeah, ditto. You know, I think I've said this story before uh, when when uh, my wife and I were expecting our third uh, Hamza, my oldest, had just seen Jurassic Park, and uh, you know he, he and his uh, brother. Or so we were expecting our fourth, and he, he he got his brothers into it. So so this is summer of 2013, and uh, um, we just found out we were having another boy. And uh, the my my three older boys, you know, they're uh, you know they're like six and four, and you know two basically. But but the, the older ones, they come to me and they're like, we have a list of names for for the baby. <laughs> and and the list was like Alan Grant, Ian Malcolm, <laughs> Indiana Jones, and <laughs> Mr. Hammond. That's, can you imagine if you, you know, like the night before your wedding night, got a glimpse of like, here are the, the names your kids are going to ask, uh, you know, for their little brother. <laughs> you know, you'd be like, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny because because uh, uh, I, I had hoped to meet uh, Jeff Goldblum earlier this year at a convention. He was originally going to be making an appearance, and I was like, "Man, I got to tell him that story," you know? Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. And then we got the kids. We, that, we, we have the too. target audience. Yeah, exactly. I I mean, I don't know about you, but a lot of times kids in movies can sort of derail the film. But Very I much really so. like these kids. Yes, it, there is there is sort of movie kid syndrome. Yes. Uh, which, yeah, but, but I mean, one thing that we know about Steven Spielberg, he knows how to direct kids like few directors do. Yeah. Uh, we've seen that again and again. And, and yeah, I mean, uh, Lex and Tim, there was the potential there. You can see the version where they're a little too precocious Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and a little too, oh, well, you know, the, the, the Pachycephala, whatever, you know, like being like that. Uh, Yeah. 
you know, like Louis C.K. has this routine where he's like, people who are like, people from Phoenix are Phoenicians. And you're like, shut up. <laughs> uh, you know, you could see a version of those kids. But I mean, I, th- I think they're they're cute. You know? This whole scene right here, the introduction that this little boy idolizes Grant is just, like, delightful. It's great. And I love that Grant is just trying to – he's weaving his way around without trying to be like, dude, just leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I love Ellie's reaction. It's yeah. it's really sweet, their relationship. Yeah. And he gets out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> but even then, you know, which which car are you doing? Like, the one that you're going in. I mean, then you're with this kid the rest of the movie. You love <laughs> right. this guy. You know, because he loves him. Like it's that's the thing. You know, yeah, it's just very cute. Yeah, and then apparently the uh, the actor Joseph Mazzello tried out for Hook, but he was too young, and Spielberg promised him he would put him in a movie eventually. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Well, and and not only uh, did he put him in this, he also put him and uh, Ariana Richards, who plays Lex, in in a, a very brief cameo in The Lost World. Right. Right. And uh, Joe, Joe Mazzello has talked about that. He's like, I, I call that my uh, uh, my graduation present from Steven Spielberg because that little cameo basically p- paid for his college. <laughs> Which is good work if you can get it. Yeah, sure. See, That's so, funny, too, that that should make me upset. You know, just sort of like <laughs> right. the business end of things. But I'm like, that's so great. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Jackson. Sam Free Jackson. This is the fiction. first time I ever saw Sam Jackson was in this movie. Yeah, this is like his loaded weapon days. It is. When <laughs> right. when he tried to have hair. Yeah, yeah. Right. Before he leaned Hold into on the baldness. Yeah. Oh, Hold that's part your of butts. your uh, Nostalgia Theater opening. I was about to Hold say, that, that catchphrase, Hold on to your butts, lives on thanks to your friend and mine, Sean Coyle, who yeah. made that uh, part of my Nostalgia Theater podcast intro. Now, you know this is a 1993 movie because uh, uh, Sam Jackson is smoking like a chimney. Yeah, Every it's funny shot. how that stands out now, yeah. Uh, you would never see that in a movie today. No, yeah, when a character smokes in a movie now, you're like, oh. He's a bad this? guy. Yeah, exactly. You know? Now, now the the uh, the lawyer here, Gennaro, uh, he's he's much more prominent in the book, and he's actually not as, as weaselly mm. as portrayed here. And and by the way, here, you know, where, where uh, Malcolm's like, oh, what do you got in there, King Kong? Uh, again, part of that is sort of establishing his character just being an insufferable snide ass. Um, <laughs> but it's also hanging a lampshade on all the influences of this movie. Yes. Uh, of which, obviously, King Kong was a big one. Actually, even, even more so for the second one, King Kong was an influence um, for The hmm. Lost World. And also spared no expense. So many lines from this that I know. people still sort of say. <laughs> but uh, and then also on the you'll note on the front of the cars you can see this big camera, and obviously it makes sense within the world for its purposes. But that was so these things were, these cars weren't actually automated. There was a stuntman driving them from the trunk. Oh. And he was using that camera. Oh, how funny! Yeah. Wow, I I did not know that. That's amazing. Yeah. See again, it's like we had our big dinosaur reveal in the in 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 that that intro sequence, and then it's just again the expectation dials up. Yeah, that's I didn't even think about that. He gives us uh, he gives us a taste because we need it. Yeah, and then he holds it back so we go nuts when we finally see the T Rex during the storm. Well, and and what are we doing? We're spending time with the characters. We're getting to know the characters more. Yeah, um, and I think it says something that. We're just as interested as what's happening in the control room. Yeah. Like all this yeah. stuff sitting at monitors and stuff. Like I, I find it compelling and I, I found it interesting even as a kid. No, same. Uh, I, I never got bored. Of it. This is a movie too where much like Back to the Future, there's always a moment that happens where I go, oh, we're here already? Right. I can't <laughs> right. remember what it is with this one. But um, with, with Back to the Future, it's when it's the night of the dance. I'm like, whoa, 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 we're here? This is like the end of the movie. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I feel like I have that same sensation with this one. And by the way, I never, I've never i read this, and I never noticed it till right now, that Nedry is watching Jaws on his computer. Oh, how funny. I, I, yeah. didn't, I didn't pick up on that. It's the scene. It's on his far monitor that I think we don't see very often, and it's the scene where Roy Scheider is doing the chum. Wow. Yeah, how funny. Spielberg is really, uh, oh, there it is. See it? Yep. Um. Yeah. Apparently, you know, when he just did Ready Player One, he's like, "I don't want to reference myself." So it's kind of funny that he actually did do that. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, there, there's like a, a, a Facebook challenge going on right now where it's like, make me choose between two movies. And and I've gotten a few <laughs> times people asking me to choose between Jaws and Jurassic Park. And maybe just because I'm in like a Jurassic state of mind right now, I've been like, Jurassic, I think. And and the truth is, I can't choose between them because I just, I love them I both. They're just so, they're both so good, you know? That's, I mean, that's like unfair, but I think I would probably go Jurassic too. And I know that, I, I think that speaks to our age probably. I, yeah, I think so. I think you're right. Yeah. See, now, now, now why do you show up to a movie about Jurassic Park, uh, uh, called Jurassic Park, uh, to see a Tyrannosaurus Rex? Mm-hmm. And, and again, they, they, they keep it at bay, man. They don't, they, they tease it out. And when it finally does make its appearance, whew, it's worth the price of admission. I think it's one of the best sequences Spielberg ever directed. Yeah. That 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 whole truck trying to uh, T-Rex thing. Now th- this shot right here, I love how it's the comedy rule of 3 and it just plays out in one shot. Yeah, yeah, you're right. All just with rack focus I'm noticing right now. Yeah. yeah. And then and then uh, Ellie drops the punchline and then both of them just, you know. Yep. <laughs> look at <laughs> Look at Ellie. Oh, I like Grant smiling. <laughs> He's like that's my that's my <laughs> That's my girl. Yeah, it's kind of a shame that they don't end up together. You know, we find out later in, in Jurassic 3. And and that yeah. was actually Joe Johnston, the director, uh, did not want them to end up together because he found the, the age difference between them a little creepy. Oh, interesting. See, I mean, I guess because I was a kid, they were both just adults. They me. were just adults. Yeah, isn't that funny? They were totally. Yeah. yeah. I remember, man, I, this is kind of taking me back. Because I'm examining this film as I watch it right now. But I remember being a kid and that goat being brought up and being like, what is going to happen? Like, I remember the palpable tension of this moment. Like, you want to see something happen, but you kind of don't. And the beauty of it is that uh, that that it, that's like that's the plant that's been placed there. Yep. And then it'll pay off, you know, down, like when, when we've forgotten about it, it'll pay off. Yep. Yep. What happened to the goat? <laughs> That's great. It's perfect. You know, I uh, I think I've mentioned this on our show, but this is the movie I've seen most in the theater. So how many and, times? Uh, uh, my brother and I, summer of 93, saw it eight times. Eight times during its initial run. Initial run. And that part of that was a second run theater. But uh, yeah, we'd get on our bikes, be like, Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park. <laughs> That's That just sounds fun, doesn't it? Oh, man. I never got tired of it. I'm not tired of watching it right now. It's just one of those w- weird lightning in a bottle uh, movie magic things. Now, w- w- over here where he starts uh, explaining chaos theory, I-, I was fascinated by chaos theory. Again, I was like Ian Malcolm fanboy number one. Like You don't even know, Brian. <laughs> yeah. if, if you knew me in sum- summer of 93 slash, you know, fall of 93, you would have been like, this guy's insufferable. I will I will never do a commentary track about Jurassic Park with this <laughs> son of a bitch. That's what you would have thought about me. Uh, because, I, because I just found him so charming. I was like, I'm in love with this guy, you know? Right. And and what I love is he's 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 macking on Laura Dern big time. Yeah. And, and Sam Neill doesn't even pay attention. Like, he does this subtle stuff where he's like kind of touching her hair and stuff. He's completely hitting on her. Yeah, yeah. But he's doing it in this in this Jeff Goldblumy way, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because so much of this is the performance. I mean, the character as written is brilliant, but but it emerges the character emerges through his performance. Yeah. This whole yeah, he scene, could have come off just douchey, as but douchey. He, he comes off as lovable. He's in this so weird way. charming, you know. Yeah. And and what he says about chaos theory here, I mean, I, again, I'm 13 years old. It blew my hair back. I was like, this is amazing. And I was like reading up on it. I like wrote an article huh. about it for some really this youth group I used to be a part of. I I was seriously enamored of the whole concept of chaos theory. You know. That's really that's kind of cool. Yeah. You know, something like that sparks a kid's imagination. Yeah, and again, but again, I, I, uh, I clearly I had none of the charm of Jeff Goldblum. It uh, <laughs> d- didn't work out in the least for me. You know, <laughs> that joke is so funny. By the way, the here I am in a car uh, talking to myself. Right. That, that's chaos. <laughs> that's chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Only Goldblum could sell that. <laughs> now Bob no. Peck as as Muldoon. You know, I I 
I like the the seriousness with which he he plays the role. But you know, when you when you compare his role as game warden to uh, you know the the character of Owen Grady played by Chris Pratt, like you kind of see where Muldoon went wrong to some extent, which is treating the Raptors as vicious beasts as opposed to animals. Mm, huh. it's, it's interesting. You know. I know mean, that's just again. This is just with the benefit of having watched all four of them. You're like, ah, oh, see, Muldoon. You know, mm-hmm. you weren't so clever, boy. <laughs> you can't get. Getting... <laughs> this is cute here too. The girl wants to hold his hand. So she's got like, like a little crush on him. Yeah. So here we get another dinosaur. It's funny because yeah, we we see the the uh, the. The Stegosaurus, uh, again, look at the reveal here where we just go through the weeds. and Through the, the grass, weeds. yeah. That's great. But uh, there's this picture of Spielberg, like, sitting in front of this, and some it, it went <laughs> viral where people are like, look at this son of a bitch posing in front of this animal that he killed. You know? <laughs> right, right. But what's funny is how many people thought it was real. I know, I know. It's uh, Yeah. <laughs> in our quick click culture. <laughs> Spielberg, Spielberg, we thought we knew you. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. son of a yeah. I mean the 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 practical dinosaurs created by by Stan Winston. I mean look at this right. That that's the thing is you've got the digital stuff, but you need this stuff too mm-hmm. uh, to really sell it. You know, there's the 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 bit that we see. And look at her reaction. She's all on the verge of tears. You know. Yeah. It's it's just wonder. You know, you buy it. Uh, and that's I mean that's that's acting right. Like. That's you know effects can only carry it so much. You have to get a performance out of your your actors that makes you believe in the effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we have that that shot coming up where Grant is like leaning on the Triceratops and it's like as it's breathing. You know. Yeah, yeah, that's a great moment. The, going along you're with right what there. you're saying, where you just you sell, they're selling this thing that like they are having a magical moment with this living breathing thing that's clearly just you know. A lump of plastic. Yeah. Yeah. It's sweet. And then, yeah, the we get an eye dilating here. That's that goes a long way, dilating eyes, as we've seen in E.T. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because, because when they started developing this movie, they had every intention of it being stop motion and models and things like that. Yeah, can you imagine? Yeah, yeah I mean, in hindsight, you're like, well, how the hell would you have done that, you know? Yeah. Like, can you imagine well, them being chased around by a stop motion T-Rex? Would that have worked? I, 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 it's, I have a hard time imagining it. I wish I could see some test footage of that. Yeah. You know? But, uh, but yeah, I guess we, we forgot to mention it, but that's uh, Phil Tippett, who is, uh, he had, what did he call it, Go Motion was his brand of stop yes, motion? that's right. And that's what he was going to do for this film. But then Dennis Murin was like, I think we could do this through computers. And then when they... Uh, showed the footage to Spielberg and Tippett to see if it was something they wanted to do. Tippett said, looks like I'm extinct. <laughs> and Spielberg loved that line so much. That's why that was put in the film. Yeah. That, and and he, he put it in Ian Malcolm's mouth. Yeah. And, and Dennis Murin, I mean, at that stage, it, it wasn't even fully formed dinosaurs. It was skeletons. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it was, can we, can we sell realistic movement? Yeah. And then of course, here's one of my favorite, <laughs> uh, lines slash memes. Whenever somebody says something stupid on the internet, you can just post a meme of that. That is a oh, big pile of shit. The, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So many memorable lines in this. Would um, you do that, Brian? Would you Would you go elbow deep into uh, dinosaur poop? I would not. I would not be saying that close because I imagine I would be gagging. Yeah. Um. But yeah, Dennis Murin, I mean, he's worth a shout out because I was thinking about this. I mean, he's been involved in every single movie I've ever loved. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Star Wars, E.T., uh, Terminator 2, this, just, I mean, that's just to name a few. I mean, yeah. he's, he's a very, very important behind the scenes figure. He, he's a he's a living legend, no doubt. Yeah. Look at this old ass computer. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, Look is it... The- uh, if I am not mistaken, when you see some footage of the docs that Nedry's looking at, it mm-hmm. actually is just a like a quick time movie and you can see the Yeah, you can see the artifacting and stuff. Yeah, but also, you know, when you hit play I can't the timeline, I guess is what I'm trying to say. 
you can see the oh how funny i, I yeah. never noticed that that's really but funny. like back then i was like yeah what else okay <laughs> <laughs> Now, now, in terms of story mechanics here, this is important because because we're separating the characters from each other mm-hmm. in different ways, and we're reconfiguring who's in which car and whatnot. And, and I think that's all important because you've got multiple prongs of story. Yep. Uh, the, and again, it, it it happens such a way you're not paying attention to it, but when you when you take a high level view, it's very clinical. How like okay, we got to get this character here. You got to get this character mm-hmm. there. You know. Yeah, but it makes sense why she would want to stay. And yeah, this is also where I learned the the word tenacious. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, <laughs> Sam Jackson. Yeah, it's funny. I forget that it's Sam Jackson. He's so this guy to me in this movie. Yeah, and he's just a little. I mean, he's still got his you know Sam Jacksonness to it, but he also does feel like a character rather than now. Sam Jackson feels like Sam Jackson in a movie. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, when we look at the history of his career, obviously playing Jules in in Pulp Fiction is what uh, unleashed the genie from the bottle, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's when he truly became who he was destined to be. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right that's when he grabbed the lightsaber you know um and and yeah so this is i mean like you said like this and loaded weapon and um amos and andrew isn't he in that yeah i remember that name only yeah like i mean there, there was a while there where it was like oh i know samuel L. jackson but like why do i know samuel L. jackson like I, I was a film nerd that's why i knew him you know exactly exactly also, uh, worth noting, and I, I'm trying to look at it, look it up. I can't remember, but there was a big hurricane that hit when they wanted to film this. Yes, in Hawaii, and that footage we saw as things are escalating with the Nedry and the docks and everything. That was apparently real footage right before they left, where Spielberg, uh, you know, went to Dean Kundi, who was the DP on this, was like, "Go get some of this." <laughs> as as he's like blown away by the hurricane he's like i regret nothing <laughs> yeah yeah and he was uh dean kundi if i'm saying that right or kundi he it was the uh zemex's dp for a long time yes and did you know the back to the future films the actually he, his first movie i want to say or at least his most no- first notable movie was halloween um and wow. he was a huge dp of note and then you know now working for spielberg and i always wondered kind of what happened to him I know that he was uh, one of the names floated at one time to direct the third JP movie. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Now, now the storm thing that that's it's it's interesting to me that uh, that was something that Spielberg sort of came up with as a way to heighten the tension of the T Rex reveal mm-hmm. uh, in terms of having it being uh, in the rain and whatnot. That and that was not something that they had planned for. The effects technicians had not planned for that. Right, and and so it caused all kinds of problems with with the you know the 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 armature that was just this massive you know the T Rex is in in the sequence is is half practical half digital, mm-hmm. and all the close up shots any time where you don't see the full body of the T Rex that's because it's a practical uh, on set uh, you know creation. Yeah, and apparently all that water wreaked havoc on it, so people would have to dry it overnight. Yeah. They were like um, patting it down. Yeah. Now this uh, this uh, this uh, embryo room here. I just I got my kid a, a Jurassic Park uh, Lego set, and it's the it's the 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 computer room where the Raptors are trying to get in at the end. Yeah. And then adjacent to it is the embryo lab. <laughs> really? I and can't I'm, believe that's a, a Lego set. <laughs> isn't that? I was I was I'm looking at this thing. I'm like I would have killed for something like this when I was absolutely. That age. You know. It's so funny that it's still. The stuff that we didn't have as kids, they're making it now. I know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know? Like a decent lightsaber toy and right. all this stuff I would have killed for as a kid. So funny. So the whole thing, like, the the whole thing with Nedry, he's basically been paid by InGen's rivals to steal a bunch of embryos and, and, and so that they can make their own dinosaurs. Right. Uh, uh, Triassic Park. <laughs> right. just across the street it's like competing gas stations yeah right but Burger it's just King. funny how he's just so incompetent that he screws it up like he he's 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 one of those villains where you know they they, they um there's in in dramaturgical terms it's uh, you have uh, uh righteous vengeance where like if you if you push a character uh hard enough you don't you, you 
you don't mind whatever that character does in retaliation. And I feel like uh, an, an antecedent to that is like the, the idea of just a character who's so reprehensible mm-hmm. that you don't mind whatever happens to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I feel like Dennis Nedry is that because he shed no tears when he meets his, his inevitable fate. Yeah, yeah. And it, oh, what a great, terrifying sequence that is. It is. Coming up on it. Um. Yeah, but apparently that dinosaur, is that the Dilophosaur? The Dilophosaurus, yeah. Yeah, apparently they, it was supposed to move, and they even built a track for it, but it wasn't moving like they wanted. So Spielberg improvised, and you have this brilliant, scary, scary moment where it's like it's in one spot, and then he moves, and he turns around, and it's <laughs> closer. And it's, it's, it's way better. Isn't that funny? It's horrifying. Yeah, and 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 then look at this. I mean, this is this like is some great. out of a <laughs> it's it's like, like the doc. He just spins it. Damn it! <laughs> you almost like you want to add like Seinfeld sound effects underneath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we cut to Kramer's doing some goofy, and we cut back to Newman getting eaten by a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by the way, when I'm like typing on a computer, sometimes I do this where I pretend like I have the cigarette in my mouth. I'm like access main grid. <laughs> That's his main program. <laughs> and do people just kind of, they look people... at you and then they just keep doing what they're doing? I always have to explain what I'm doing so they'll appreciate my joke. I'm like, what I'm doing right now is referencing this movie. You it's see. very amusing to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then don't, we don't, you know, you didn't say the magic word. Got to so acknowledge funny. that. I love that. Right, right now, download. Hammond is like, where did the vehicle stop? And we just cut back to the goat. And we know. Yeah, cut back to the goat. It's like, of the all rain. the places, of all the places to stop. I had a, I know this is obvious, but when I was younger, I, I had a boss who loved movies, and he one time told me, you know, he's just like everything is better with rain. He's like, so if you have a scene, there's high tension and whatever, and it's it's going great, it'll be even greater with rain. Well, I, and I always think about that now. Whenever it rains in a movie, I always think like about the decision of rain. And I'm like, yeah. And and I mean, you look at this sequence, and you're like, how could it not be raining? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the rain is, like, part of the cast in this scene. <laughs> in this know? sequence? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And by yeah, the way, we, about... we, we see that night uh, vision helmet in uh, in uh, Jurassic World. Yeah. I think about this line all the time, too. Are they heavy? Then they're expensive. Put them back. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think about that in life now. <laughs> Now, now, we talk about, like, being happy, you know, when we see a reprehensible character die. I have to admit, I feel a little bad about what happens to the lawyer, because... Oh, yeah, yeah. He doesn't deserve that. I mean, it is, you know, the fact that he runs out of the car and abandons the kids, I guess, is, like, the 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 moral justification for his horrible death. Sure, sure. You know? But it's still pretty, like, horrifying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we don't We don't relish in it. That's right. Much. Not too much, yeah. <laughs> oh, we we glossed over his his great line too earlier, where he's like, "Now are these dinosaurs auto erotica." <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, no, he says that about the the people. Uh, oh, the people, yeah, on the tour, yeah, on the yeah, tour. Yeah, these, uh, now, now over here, this right here, this is another one of these Spielberg things where he's like, "I need perfect concentric circles." In a glass, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and the, it's up to the technicians to figure out how to do that. Yeah, because apparently he noticed that while he was listening to music in his car on his rearview mirror and was like, I, I need that. I need that sensation. And so apparently w- the way they did it was they put a guitar string below right. the dashboard and plucked the guitar string. Yeah. I mean, who thinks but, of this stuff, you know? It's funny because I was like, well, what about just pounding your fist? I mean, that's what I've done my whole life since I saw this movie, just pounding my fist on the dashboard. <laughs> and does that work? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> what happened to the goat? This is fantastic. <laughs> That's Boom. great. Look at that. Here we go. Boom. Talk about amazing staging, this entire sequence. So fantastic, yeah. Oh, man. I, I mean, mean it, look at the, the slow whole... reveal of the tear. It's like the mirror of the slow reaction shot of Alan Grant when he first sees the dinosaurs. It's like the camera goes up a little bit, and then yeah, yeah it's yeah, like yeah, the right. the. Now, <laughs> I, and then he he runs off. Where's he going? And then of course Malcolm. If you gotta go, you gotta go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That's great. But the patience and deliberation and the execution of this whole sequence here is just. Just starting with them sitting bored in the rain. You know, yeah, and then we don't have the dinosaur just burst out. I mean, it's just, what's happening? I mean, what's happening? I mean we are literally, 
with the fence. We're 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 an hour, we're halfway through, and we're an hour and five minutes into the movie for one of the biggest stars to finally be revealed. Yeah, you know. Look at that. That still looks good. It's it's amazing. The T Rex, seeing it walk over the fence here. I'm trying to narrate for the people who aren't, it, <laughs> who aren't watching it. It still holds up. Look at that. It does. I love it. Uh, I hate being right all the time. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, this this track is gonna be mostly me being like, ah, uh, Ian Malcolm, this guy. Yeah, this is a guy. Now, this vision based on movement thing comes from the book, but that was more of a telling sign that things weren't going the way they were supposed to, right? I I think so. Right, like it, it yes. wasn't really supposed to be. That's how T Rexes were. That was. Some sort of glitch because they weren't created exactly right. And that was yeah. something they discovered. Yeah, and, and 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 the book gets much deeper into uh, sort of the the scientific. Like, there's this entire passage just given over to scientific, uh, you know, lectures. I guess. Right, right. That was usually the stuff that I skipped past when I read the book. You know. Yeah, it'd be interesting to go back and revisit that. I mean, I read it when I was twelve or something. Yeah, before this movie came out. Before the movie. Now I remember this scene here. Uh, watching it with my kid again. He was six at the time. And we were watching it. We were watching it in 3D. Yeah. And at the the moment when the Rex like comes through the roof. Yeah. I mean, he wanted to climb over his seat. Like <laughs> literally, I remember him like grabbing the back of the seat and trying to like get behind the seat. And I was I was gl- glanced over. I'm like, oh man, I hope I didn't just break him. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's all I need. You know. You know what's funny though? Spielberg, he dips into horror more than I think people realize. Yeah. But he makes this really great, weird family friendly horror where it's like, it's horrifying. It's sort of like putting your hands over your eyes, but you have to peek between. Yes. Yes. You know, whereas if you're watching like some horror, straight horror movie, you cover your eyes for a moment and then you can look again. But Spielberg is like, nah, you kind of want to look. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, again, you can see the version of this where not only are people getting ripped in half, but you're seeing their entrails and, you're, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the hard R Jurassic Park. And, and that might have had an appeal, but I don't think it would have played the way this did. No, no. Yeah, this remains fun. Yes. I, yeah. But this whole sequence, I think, is so fantastic. And, and uh, insofar as, as we look at sort of Alan Grant's arc, uh, the, I mean, not that he wouldn't help little kids, but, I mean, it it really cements his heroic role. Yes. Um, again, it's like, well, and he's decided that he likes kids. And I was like, well, no, of course he would help. Yeah, that's... <laughs> but, <laughs> right, right. Well, I don't like kids, but I guess I should help him. And he reaches a realization. <laughs> But again, it, it's uh, uh, this is something Jeff Goldblum talked about, where uh, originally, as written, Malcolm was supposed to take off the same way Gennaro did. Mm. He was supposed to run away, and and uh, uh, he went to Spielberg and he said, "Well, what if I do this? What if I take the flare and and I, I distract the dinosaur?" And and they put that in at at Goldblum's suggestion. And it's great; it makes him all the better of a character. Yeah, and it, it, it makes him heroic. And for some reason, I've always loved Sam Neill's delivery where he's like, Ian, freeze! Yeah, 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 it's great. And that sort of push in. Now, what's fascinating to me is Gennaro was actually taking a shit here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it, doesn't it? All right, yeah. Like, why is, this, why is his pants all rolled up like that? What's going on there? Uh, and this is the first time we see the dinosaurs doing their dinosaur thing. <laughs> doing their dinosauring it up, yeah. Yeah. But this also uh, goes back to one of those things that I, I talk about a lot. And, you know, you get me a little tipsy. This is the thing I'll sort of rail on about, which is telling about me. But, like, my favorite <laughs> thing in a movie <laughs> is a sequence that happens in one location and they use every single thing there to maximum effect. I, I, I need you to do that as drunk Brian now. So, <laughs> you, you know what I like in a movie? <laughs> I'll well, tell like, you. <laughs> see, the the bad version of this is the T-Rex comes out, just comes bursting out of the gate, and then they're, you know, running around and jumping through a thing, and then whatever. I mean, we'll get to that. But, like, in this sequence, what's so brilliant about it is we are in this one location for what is, what, probably 10 minutes? Yep. And it is maybe one of the best sequences, aside from the kitchen, in this movie. And 
you have the car and then the thing you have a glass roof so it goes through the glass roof and then it tips it over and that's scary enough but then there's mud and the kids it's pushing the thing down and they might drown in the mud and then they get out and that's great but now he's pushing it around and nudging them up against a wall and now they're on the wall but then he's going to push the thing over the wall like it's that's it's oh see now it's only drunk brian <laughs> Well, it's, that, it's, it's, it's you know, it's like Native Americans. They would make sure every part of the animal was used. They didn't let that, it even go to go to waste. Yes, <laughs> that's yes, Spielberg I mean, with seriously. a with a set piece. And absolutely, and we've we've talked about this. I mean, that's I E T was my first movie, so for me, it's been cemented in my brain that that's how it's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. And then look at this. Say we're using the same one truck. For them on the wall, hanging from that cable, and they got to get out of the way before it falls down and squashes them. And they get right out of the way in time. Yeah, this is... And, you know, yeah. going back to what we were talking about earlier, Brian, about Harrison Ford, right? I, I feel like we we're so conditioned uh, from, you know, uh, Ford and Spielberg's Indiana Jones collaborations that we... Uh, you know, th- th- there, there is. Those are sort of heightened reality. You know, mm-hmm. yes. And, and I feel like, like what we just saw, where Lex is like choking him, and he's trying to get yes. over that rope. Like it, it needs to feel more real. Yes. Uh, and I feel like th- that. I don't know. You know, you, does it? Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Like, no, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I, I again, it's, it's like I, I can't see it working as well if Harrison Ford had been in it. I I totally agree. Well, I think I feel like he's even said like he he regrets turning it down. You know. Oh, interesting. I think I think Spielberg showed him like a sample poster, like to try to pitch him on the movie, but he just wasn't oh with his face on it. Yeah. Huh. Like being chased by a dinosaur or something. Yeah. That's yeah. like a trailer line. I can't get Jurassic Park back online. <laughs> yeah. Wait. What? Can you tell me what Harrison Ford? how he turned it down to Spielberg? I think he was like, I don't know, it's a, it's a dinosaur. It's just... A, it's a, it's a, and Spielberg But Harrison, like, okay. the kids are going to love it. Yeah. It'll be Indiana Jones to a whole new generation. <laughs> well, when you put it that way, I, I guess I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so so here's the, the sequence we were just talking about earlier. D- Nedry v. Dilophosaurus. And uh, yeah. uh, per, per Spielberg, he's talked about how how the little, the, the the frilly fan thing that was his own uh, innovation on the Dilophosaur. Yeah, he, that yeah. that was not uh, that was just something that he wanted to do, and he had this idea of it like flapping, uh, like a, like a uh, like a tent in the breeze, hmm. and that's why when it when it spits the venom, like the venom spitting was just that was something he made up, but the idea that the the the, the fan goes. That was just like in his head, he saw that. Hmm. And, you know, again, when you're Steven Spielberg, you tell your effects guy, you're like, hey, I wanted to go. And it's like, okay. <laughs> whatever you say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. And then you just cut back to them in some, you know, smoky room, like, oh my gosh, what are we going to, you know, <laughs> what does that even mean? I don't know. Now, now this here, this is a Jurassic trope where yeah. you have like the one character who gets like lost in the woods. And you know mm. things are going to go badly for them. You know we see something similar with Peter Stormari as as Dieter Stark in uh, in, yeah. the, in the second one, where the further into the woods you get, the more you're like, all right, this is not going to end well. I don't think. Yeah. Oh, how terrifying! Right. He turns around and it's right behind him. It's it's even creepy too because it has this face of evil, but a weird playfulness to it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's a creepy looking thing. It's funny too because I was reading that Spielberg always felt like there wasn't enough rain in this scene. And watching it now, I don't know how much more was, rain you could have. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I want Noah to float by in a boat. <laughs> right. That's how much rain I want. Good lord. <laughs> oh, this is so. This is such great escalation here. Throw the stick. Nope, I'm not interested. I'm interested in you. And that's. I mean, the beauty of it. It's like we know because we're conditioned to know. That it's not going to end well for this guy. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so we're sort of watching the clock count down to to this inevitable, uh, uh, you know, reckoning. Yeah. What was that? So right there, you see no, how I it kind of how it oh, like, yeah, yeah. like that was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, and that tar. Ugh. I feel like I just saw a cable. 
Uh, for the dinosaur? Yeah. Well, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't ruin I'm this for me, guy. Brian. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I am the guy that's just like, you want to see the cable? I'm like, I don't, I'm not going to point it out. <laughs> I don't see it. What'd you see? Now, now the Barbasol can, Spielberg has said he put, he left it out there as a thing that they could, you know, build a sequel around. Yeah. And so, and so when Crichton just didn't do anything with that at all, he was like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's funny. I guess not, you know? Yeah. Because Crichton went in a completely different direction with the whole site B and everything else. But, uh, right. Uh, this, I mean, I, if I'm not mistaken, there is a, I think a video game that they did that that is sort of set concurrent to the events of this film that revolve around uh, efforts to retrieve that that uh, shaving cream can. Oh, interesting. Like I don't know how. But who uh, would know about it? Well, I, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe not concurrently, but like subsequent yeah, yeah, yeah. to or so, something. Yeah, but but uh, there's this whole catalog of extant Jurassic Park material. I, yeah, I wouldn't consider it canonical necessarily, but there's you know games and comics and all this stuff that have really built out the universe. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, if that can's out there, someone should utilize it for story. Yeah, I mean, well, I think I think what the guy what 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 Doxon says at the beginning in the beginning is like it it it'll preserve that stuff for like 36 hours. Oh, I isn't that funny? I've watched it so many times. I don't even remember that detail. I, I, yeah, it's it's not it's not uh, inevitable, but I mean that's you can find a workaround. Be like, oh, it got preserved in like a fossil, and yeah, I mean, you know what I mean. You could, yeah, 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 movie logic. I mean, it's all it's all sure, sure. believe anyway. I have to point this out. Uh, you know, everyone has a movie that or a line in a movie that isn't special to anyone else but them. Um, my brother and I, the line for us is always uh, when Lex is like, he left us. He left us. Yeah. And then you cut to Grant and he's got this splat, like 1930 splash of light across his eyes. And he's like, but that's not what I'm going to do. Right. We love Well, it's that. great. I mean, you know, he's such a great heroic character. Yeah. And, and you know, I remember one of the critiques at the time uh, was, oh, he, he's he's a very bland character. Hmm. And, and, oh, it's, you know, like, what do we really know about him? And, you know, it's just funny how... Some you know you look at some of some of those contemporaneous reviews and you're like man you're not you're not taking a long view you know yeah uh, he's he's the kind of character that a kid will look up to huh I never thought of it that way yeah it's, but well n- chiefly or, or, or of this moment I I always thought the point uh, right here where the boy goes I threw up in the car I was always like that's such a little boy thing to say yeah that reminds me of like a feeling. Of like being a little boy, and then when he's like, "I, I won't tell you when you threw up." That reminds me like of a... when I was a little boy and I threw up in the car. It reminds <laughs> me of that. Really? No, I. <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure if you're making a joke, but yeah, but I think that speaks to what you're just saying right here, where that's like what a a guy that a kid would look up to, like I won't tell you when you threw up. Like I'm yeah. here to help you. You know, I don't know. Is there something like, very paternal like in, about all in this? In this scenario, as depicted in the film, right? If we if we look at uh, the the kids being sort of the primary audience then alan grant is who you want to be trapped in jurassic park with yeah 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 right Still and and, the car, and by the way. you know brian i mean with that in mind i mean i think to some extent that could uh, illustrate why uh the lost world is maybe not as well perceived is that ian malcolm for as much as i like him uh is not alan grant right right uh you know in in some ways malcolm uh I disagree with this, but uh, some some people would say he works better as a secondary character. Well, I think he, I I think he's a great, he could be a great lead, but I I don't even remember exactly what Vince Vaughn and Julianne Moore are like in that movie. Sure. Well, you know? well, well, they are Vince Vaughn and Julianne Moore. <laughs> sure, sure. Vince Vaughn is just doing his Vince Vaughn. He has Vince Vaughn. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's fantastic, by the way. That right I'm there, getting down by the tree, and then perfect. they're like, "We're good," and then the car just topples on top of them. <laughs> We're back in the car again. <laughs> so great. Yeah, I mean, the kids feel like kids. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, I mean, uh, it, we, we've talked before about Spielberg's ability to direct kids really well, and I think it's that it's they 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 don't feel smarter. They don't feel like little adults. Yes. Yes. You know? Which is a movie this, thing. Speaking of the rain also and, and its effect, you can really sense that sort of ominous after the rain feeling now. When, yeah. Uh, 
Lord Durin. I, I can almost smell it, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I think this um, was Gennaro. I think this was too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I was listening to the score this week. And I got to this moment, I could hear them saying those lines. We were talking about, we were texting about that. <laughs> now, uh, originally, uh, at least as as written in the book, I don't know if this was uh, the plan for the movie, but uh, the wounds that Malcolm receives here uh, would uh, eventually lead to him dying. Oh, interesting. Right, he dies in the book. Hmm. Um, and and what I've often said is that is that the movie sacrificed Muldoon so that Malcolm could live because in the book Muldoon lives. Huh. And uh, you know that was a calculus that they made. I think I think in 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 the big picture it was the right calculus because because when Crichton wrote The Lost World, he was so enamored of Jeff Goldblum's portrayal of Malcolm that he brought Malcolm back from the dead. <laughs> How did he do that? Do you remember? Yeah, well, uh, well I haven't read the Lost World uh, book, but my, my understanding is it's kind of like yeah, and uh, uh, they thought he was dead, but he wasn't. Like. <laughs> <laughs> they should have just taken his DNA and recreated him. <laughs> in a lab. <laughs> I mean, you got the technology right there. It writes itself. So this is great. We, and now we're conditioned to see the ripples and go, uh-oh. Yep. <laughs> now, I don't know how they did this one. I'm more interested in how they got this on the ground. Well, they ran a guitar string under the... <laughs> yeah, beneath the earth. Beneath the earth. <laughs> Look at that. Look at the perfect symmetry. Is it? Uh, that's something that's... Sp- like, we see it now... And we're like, wow, that looks so cool. But Spielberg saw it in his head. Yeah. And was like, I want that. Yeah. That's good. Like, that's why I, I could never hope to, to do what he does. I know. I know. Just, oh, yeah, that was something. Uh... Actually, I kind of want to watch this real quick. Because this is <laughs> the, a CGI dinosaur. Let's kind of see how it holds up. Let's go faster. And that's, oh, we that... get this great joke here. It's like classic, really, the. Things in mirror, yeah, are, are closer mirror, than they appear. Closer than they appear. Oh, that's must, pretty good. Must go faster, by the way. They 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 paid homage to that uh, in Independence Day by putting that same line in Jeff Goldblum's mouth in that movie. Oh, funny. And then have have the T Rex break through a tree, so he's in the environment. And then you just buy it. Yeah, I mean, look how it still looks completely believable. It looks pretty damn good. Now, one thing paleontologists say is that the T-Rex had a top speed of, like, like 20 miles an hour. So the uh, the idea that they can't outrun it is, is pretty comical to real paleontologists. That's funny. And I say, shut up, scientists. <laughs> yeah. Don't oh, worry. yeah, I was reading somewhere that someone was like, uh, well, you know, they didn't know uh, what Velociraptors sounded like. So they had to come up with, and I was like, you don't know what any of them sounded like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> That always kind of cracks me up when I read these articles and they're like, now, you know, stegosauruses were the practical jokers of the Jurassic period. I'm like, you (laughs) do not know that. (laughs) It's like, it is all postulation. Yeah, yeah. Um, Well, you know, okay, so we should should mention here. So Spielberg was directing Schindler's List while he was in post on Jurassic Park. So while he yeah. was over in Poland, he had some sort of uh, TV channel or frequency or whatever specially set up for him that cost, uh, what I read, millions of dollars. It cost Spielberg so, money. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and and so he could review visual effects and, and whatnot. And apparently George Lucas oversaw the mix of this movie. Is that right? Yeah. and yeah. Uh, But, but it, uh, Spielberg said... That it made the experience of the emotional toll that Schindler's List was taking on him. And then when he would, after a a day like that, have to deal with dinosaurs and digital effects, it made him bitter toward this movie, which is kind of interesting. That is interesting. Right? Because so and, and understandable. I mean, I can understand how he must have felt. But it makes me wonder how he looks back on this movie now. If it's sort of he's like, yeah, no, I can appreciate it. I'm glad people like it. However... You know, it was a weird time for me, which is interesting because then this movie became his highest grossing movie, uh, surpassing E.T. Like, yes. I mean, this is a beloved movie that did gangbusters, but it's just interesting now to know that it was complicated for him. I mean, I would imagine that, it, you know, certainly with the benefit of time, he can separate 
the 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 temporal in the moment experience of making it versus you know the experience of how, how it was received right yeah I, I would hope so you know and that's that's where when i was speaking to earlier when i said i had a theory that i thought this was his last adventure film but that wasn't the case because he made the sequel to this yeah but again that that almost feels like an addendum to to this era yeah yeah um, maybe like he had a few set pieces left in his head it, well, very much so because because both the Lost World and JP three uh, heavily mine uh, uh, the first book for uh, you know uh, four set pieces. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so so um, you know the the opening of the Lost World is is where the little girl uh, encounters these compies on the beach, right? And that's actually the opening of the book. Oh, fuzzy! I don't of, of the Jurassic at Park all. book. Yeah. Now this here, uh, this is of course the sort of the culmination of of Alan's whole thing at the beginning, where he's like, ba- "Babies smell," and you know that whole thing. <laughs> right. uh, and and my kids always ask, uh, "Why why does he throw away the raptor claw?" And I say, "Well, it's because he he doesn't need to hold on to dead things because yep. you know he wants to be a he wants to fully." Uh, give himself to taking care of these kids. So it's the culmination of his arc. And I said that to my my eight year old, and he's like, "I don't know what you just said, but <laughs> it made sense to me." Is my point? I'm picturing this happening with like soft lighting and like strings, and just sort of like, "Well, you see, son, when a man grows, you know." And then just like, "I don't understand a word you just said." I don't know what you just said. I just know that I would have kept my raptor claw. <laughs> That's really cute. Now we also see the 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 remnants of of the cafeteria in Jurassic World. Yeah, man, I gotta revisit that movie, especially before seeing the next. I movie. I literally just watched it two days ago, and and uh, there's the scene where where the two kids, you know, they wander into the the again the the, the wrecked visitor center, and mm-hmm. you know your your heart kind of flutters a little bit because you're like ah oh, like that's the place that I know I've it's been the in thing that I place. love <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I ate ice cream alongside John Hammond in that place, you know? Yeah. This is another one of those things where I know as a kid, you know, the movies you love, every now and then there's like the one slow scene that you kind of want to get through. Yeah. But what I think is so great about this movie is even as a kid, I liked this scene. Yes. <laughs> Over the ice cream, you know, where he's, uh, Hammond's being a bit delusional about it all. And Laura Dern's like, wake up, dude. Yeah. But I think it's it's a beautiful uh, uh, insight into his personality, you know, that, that he's yeah. not like, I think it's really important for Hammond to not be a villain. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's misguided clearly, uh, but he's not evil. Yeah. His heart was in a decent place with yes. all of this, but he just didn't take responsibility for what he did. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as antagonists go in in the movie, you have Dennis Nedry, and that's that's really it. Yeah, uh, because everyone else is acting uh, in their capacity as just trying to survive or just trying, you know. But it's not; they're not trying to cause harm to other people. Yeah. Uh, as the series continues, we you know we are introduced to sort of evil corporate bad guy types. Yep. Uh, especially in the second one. Yeah, and I guess in this new one in Fallen Kingdom, but but uh, that's not really the case here. I mean, ultimately, it's a story of survival horror. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, if if the if uh, let's remove dinosaurs from the mix, they're they're in uh, the veldt in Africa, and it's they're trying to escape from lions and tigers. Right. It's the same set of actions and reactions. Yeah. yeah, I had I had a bit of a crush on Laura Dern from this movie. I remember that. Oh, for sure. You know, yeah, definitely. She was that that mix of like uh, feminine and sort of tomboyish. You know. Yeah, like yeah, tough. Like you go on an adventure with her. You know? Exactly. You know. <laughs> so great. Now, I, now you know. I, okay, okay, okay. I was just about to say. I mean, she says people are dying. How many fatalities have we had? We lost Gennaro, that they know of. Um, and Nedry that they don't know of. I think that's it, right? And well, and then the the security guy at the beginning. At the beginning, okay, the, that's yeah, true. Whatever. Spared no expense. <laughs> Got a little fan twirling up there. It's great. So this this right here feels very much like a stage. Yes. Yeah. One of the few in my 
Yeah, like like uh, nowadays we're so, you, certainly you and I are conditioned to know we could sort of spot it. Uh, and when I watch it, that always kind of takes me out of it a little bit. I'm like, oh, yeah. they're on a stage now. But I mean, the kid's waking up in the tree. We should say yes. And the, and yeah. there's the and this the... is the my friend the Brontosaurus track on the soundtrack. Oh, is it? Or, or my friend the Brachiosaurus? Excuse me. Yeah. Veggie source, Lex. Veggie source. Audience, <laughs> Audience. we're okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's funny. It's also interesting to me that that we go from this horrifying sequence with the T Rex, and then we the next time we see a dinosaur is in oh, but you know they're also wondrous and amazing and whatever. And I think I think there's that balancing act that needs to happen where the the dinosaurs are not monsters; they're animals. Yes, yes. Um, and that again, you know, that that's a choice that that could very easily have not been made. Where it's like oh, well, let's just make them these killing machines. Right. But I think, you know, you need to have, have the wonder because because kids love dinosaurs. That's just a fact of existence. Yeah. That's funny, isn't it? I mean, I did when I was a kid. It's just one of those things. Yeah. You go through like a dinosaur phase. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember uh, uh, when my oldest, before he had seen this, but, uh, you know, he was go- he was loved dinosaurs or whatever. And he's like, what is what is extinct? And I have to explain now to this, like five-year-old you know the concept of <laughs> what extinction is he's like are are you gonna go extinct <laughs> and i'm like oh, boy <laughs> really yeah <laughs> oh, oh man <laughs> like do i want to have this conversation with a five-year-old you know yeah but your mother would say i already did <laughs> <laughs> That's right. what dad so here we go. This is this is a crucial bit. Now, now Crichton spends quite a bit more time going into this in the book, but obviously uh, we can't have that. So he just puts a bunch of exposition in Alan Grant's mouth, and life found a way. But it's so it's so quick and so painless. You know, it's like perfect. Used uh, frog DNA, and they can change sex sometimes. And uh, let's keep going. Yeah, and it's and again, it's it's something where if you actually stopped and think and thought about it. It's the most random, ridiculous thing. That, like the, the notion that they would use frog DNA as opposed to, you know, you could, like why frog DNA? It doesn't make any sense. Right, right. But some lizard or something. Yeah, you know, yeah. You, I, I think I've heard I've heard uh, geneticists say like human DNA has more in common with dinosaurs than frogs. Like why? Oh, really? Know, like I, in in that it's so arbitrary. Like feels like it was a Google search. Like yeah, yeah. Creature. <laughs> well, they actually did research because this was before Google. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the so dark, the dinosaurs the are breeding, so obviously all of the protocols they put in place didn't work, and now it's, it's not just females on the island. And here's the iconic shot of, of Jeff Goldblum that's... Uh, <laughs> With his shirt open. He's and... he's leaning back. It's weird how, again, it, I, I, I'm telling you, it, the, it's like the rest of the world is sort of caught up to me in my just right, general affinity right, right, right. for Jeff Goldblum, because he, he really is like a beloved... On, on par with like a Christopher Walken type, where his sort of mannerisms and quirkiness have become uh, just commonly accepted and embraced, you know? Yeah, like everything from his personality, like down to his cadence. I mean, we enjoy hearing him the way he speaks. We expect it, and we want him to play it up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's weird that. But so that shot of him kind of leaning back with his shirt open, um, it's they made a Funko pop. Of that, yeah, which is hilarious. That that's almost like the the demarcation of having officially quote unquote made it. Yeah, and then I remember there was a, a a picture where they turned it into what looked like an oil painting, and there's like a butterfly on his hand, and it's just funny these things that you think only live in your mind. I mean, obviously this is well, they did this other thing, world, Brian. Right? I don't know if you saw that where they took Sam Neill listening to the heartbeat of the Triceratops and they superimposed him onto Jeff Goldblum's open chest. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but you just realize that these things are very much alive and kicking in like so many people's creative imaginations and it means just as much to so many other people that you, you just sort of, sometimes you can forget that, you know? Yeah. You feel like it's your thing. That's right. Yeah, exactly, you know? Yeah. So uh, uh, right here, this is where, where Ray Arnold uh, uh, essentially exits the movie. Yeah. And so Sam Jackson, like I said, he talked about how, you know, that hurricane that you mentioned earlier, essentially the hurricane came and it wiped out a bunch of sets and whatever. And the original plan was he was going to have a whole chase sequence with a raptor that would kill him. Right. And essentially they told him like, yeah, there's no time for that. So uh, we're just going to like find your arm. So you don't need to come to Hawaii. And he's like, son of a bitch. (laughs) Yeah. 
By the way, I got to point out like how Spielbergy this whole sequence is. Look at all these like lights and the lights just bathing the room, and then the 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 the, the, the handheld lights. It's perfect. Yeah. But again, I mean, we're invested in the characters in the control room too. Uh, yeah, and, I, and honestly, I think part of that is why it's it's helpful that they they have Ellie and and in Malcolm back here uh, because we we're we're you know we're following the action through their perspective to some extent. Right. This Gallimimus chase is a nice one. Gallimimus, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah, and apparently this was something that they had to evacuate for the hurricane. And then go back to a different island to pick up this. Oh, is that right? Scene. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't know that actually. Gala, 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 mimas. <laughs> Have you ever been to Hawaii? No. Uh, no. I, I went to Hawaii for my honeymoon many moons ago. Um, as my wife always reminds me. So when are you taking me to Hawaii again? Um, <laughs> it was many moons. <laughs> it was many moons, yeah. Uh, but uh, over they're quite proud of the fact that Hawaii is Jurassic Park, you know. So right. when you go on tours and things, they'll be like, oh, and they shot this part of Jurassic Park here or whatever. And oh, that's this, cool. This all looks very familiar to me. It's beautiful. I would enjoy that, knowing yeah. where... Uh, yeah, know, you, one you, of, my, one yeah, of your, yeah. your things to do is to go to like where they shot stuff, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly that. And I was going to say, one of my uh, good friends from Bob's Burgers for her honeymoon, she went to the spot where Indiana Jones, at the beginning of Raiders of the Lost Ark, swings on that uh, vine into the water. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, she sent a picture to all of us of her doing that alongside the capture from the movie, and it was like spot on. That spot looks exactly the same. Is that in Central America? No, in Hawaii. Oh, it is in Hawaii, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then uh, another, uh, you know... The Gallimimas jumping over that log and having the interaction with the log to sell that they're there. And I was reading that they had, you know, crew shaking the log and little explosives to, you know, have little bark and stuff spit up. Wow. Just, yeah. It's weird. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, like they still, like, even if you're relying on digital, although this happens less now because so much of this can be done digitally. Like even the, um, you can have the, you can affect the, the uh, physical environment on the set and, and do stuff with it in post. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, sure, sure. You know what I mean. But like back then, it, just just doing the digital T Rex was like we're we're firing on all cylinders just doing that. So it's like you have to have uh, 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 plan out and figure out how the practical environment will be impacted by the digital thing that's going to come in later. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, and I was talking about this earlier, but apparently, yeah, there's really only 15 minutes or so of dinosaurs in this whole movie, hmm. and six minutes of it is digital that's amazing not crazy that's bananas wow um i think this and this is the last moment malcolm this sequence is the last moment malcolm speaks in the whole movie no no he's uh oh this sequence because he 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 talks on the through the walkie through the walkie to her right yeah but then for then that's it i think you're right yeah i don't know that i ever thought about that yeah yeah, the the essentially um, the, this sequence in the book is where he he dies. Uh, his, his oh really? Yeah. He, oh, like bleed like, out kind of death. He, he his wounds eventually. He he just he dies slowly basically. But it's interesting because the book is really told through his perspective in a lot of ways because you have um, each book each chapter has like an epigraph, which is like a quote by Ian Malcolm. Huh. Because the the whole thing, you know, it's it's essentially the book is proving out his hypothesis about chaos, right? Which is that uh, life is inherently unpredictable. That there is no, you know, you you can't put put uh, boundaries on on nature, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, so the the book bears that out again. Again, I said this before, but Malcolm is very much a Crichton's surrogate for himself, right? Yeah, a, a Mary Sue for him, if you will. <laughs> I've never understood what Muldoon says here. Damn it! Even Nedry knew better than to mess with a raptor pen. Wait, well, uh, what I, he's I'm seeing with the cap with the caption, it's helping me because I always hear he's like <laughs> that's well, like how I've always heard it. So I'm like enjoying reading this here. Yeah, because 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 uh, uh, shutting down he, he, everything he was doing, he still left the raptors intact. Yeah, and really, like right here is the first time we see a raptor in the whole movie. 
Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. I mean, that's the amazing thing is I, in truth, Brian, I have not thought about that until just this moment. I'm like, we haven't seen a raptor at all. Yeah, you're right. So it's really just this and then the kitchen and the end. Yeah, I mean, the first shot we get full on of the raptor is when it uh, jumps on Muldoon. Huh. And you don't, and this is the first time we're thinking of it in 25 years, so. <laughs> so kudos to, to everybody involved. Yeah. Muldoon is, I mean, his death scene, he's very, it's, he's very much, a, he's like Quint. Yes. Yo, wow. I never thought of that. You know, I mean, it's, he is. He, he's like the hard ass who he, he dies in probably the way he absolutely did not want to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Bob Peck is so good. I mean, he he passed away, I think, in the late 90s. But uh, I I wish they had left the character alive just because he is so good, you know. Uh, There was a series of comic books that Topps Comics did. You know, did you know that Topps had a comic book company? Topps the baseball card? No. Uh, Yeah, and then in the mid to late 90s, uh, they did a bunch of licensed books, including Jurassic Park. And they did, uh, I think, from from basically the first movie to the second movie. So they did the adaptation of the first movie. And they did a whole series of sequel, you know, kind of like Marvel did, like Star Wars comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, in between the movies, they did that. So they had a comic series that picked up right where the movie left off. Huh. And it's like Grant and, and uh, uh, Sattler are working with the government to try to contain the dinosaurs. It's like a whole thing. I actually have the... They, they reprinted those recently because IDW has the license right now. I was rereading them. I'm like, man, these are fun, you know? Yeah. They're like fun, dumb stories, you know? I didn't but, know about them, but I would have enjoyed them as a kid. Yeah, yeah, it, it, and I, I have had fun reading them to my kids. But um, in that, they actually bring back Muldoon. Oh, and does he have like, like a cybernetic arm or something? No, he, he's like wounded though. He's like because we never actually see him die. Technically, That's true. And right? he's, so, he's a badass. Yeah. So, so had they done that in the second one, I would have been okay with that. Yeah, with like a big scar across his face. Yes, he's all injured, but he's like, you know, the, the you know, it it didn't last or something. You know, I had a encounter with a raptor and it didn't last or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I love that the, the whole thing where where number one where where Hammond doesn't want to, he doesn't want Ellie to go. He's and she's like, she's like, all right, when I get back, we're going to talk about your your views of, you know, sexual politics or something. Yeah, yeah you know but i also love where where he's trying to explain to her what to do and finally um and malcolm just takes the thing away from him. <laughs> yeah, like, they're like oh, we just, got this just follow the pipes yeah <laughs> yeah 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 they're, they're, I, I just this movie is just so like of course it is to me after all these years but yeah you, when you take a step back to appreciate it, you're like these are great characters and and by the way let's appreciate the the pressure cooker here where we're cutting back and yes. forth um, with the between the fence yeah exactly you know because um, because it's yeah. we know we know how dangerous the fence is because we've seen throughout the movie danger ten thousand volts it's it's been hitting us over the head right and now it's this this countdown of her and of course the the fence is like the very last one on this list you know. Right, right, right. Like it could have been first. We don't know, you know. Yeah, but no, you're right. And I mean, I mean, how many great sequences can one movie hold? Yeah, <laughs> like this. Like, it's so, yeah, all of these are like top notch. And I mean, when you think of the whole sequence to power up, it's not just power up. It's you have to do it manually. Yeah. Each every single one. Prime it, and I mean, you know, it's the whole thing. And what does it do? It just increases the tension here. Yep. And then and then oh Timmy can't do it and he's scared. And then this and then oh and she's got to do it. I mean it's uh, <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah. And talk about being able to build tension with like fence climbing. Yeah. And, I mean there's this great shot coming up right here where it's like the camera is sort of swooping down on Timmy stuck at the top of that fence. Where is it? Anyway. But yeah, it's uh right there. Yeah, I re- again, going back to I can remember the feeling as a kid. Here it is. A- as a kid just i don't know the tension just completely worked like of that fence coming on yeah oh it's perfect i'm realizing i'm at a loss for words because i'm like half watching it right now (laughs) yeah yeah i mean and i just watched this uh last week you know so yeah yeah right there yeah 
And I mean, uh, to be honest, th- this moment here where where Grant has to do CPR on him and stuff. I mean, it's it's it, this is this is what I'm saying. Like, I I really when people say that Grant is not an interesting character, I disagree. Oh, but right here, look at this best best jump in the whole movie. Oh my right god! There. Oh, that's our first full on shot of a raptor. Yep. I think you know what it is. It's just the raptors were so like omnipresent in the marketing and stuff. Yeah. Oh so, yeah, that's a good point. You know. <laughs> That's so great. And then here, here's another second biggest jump of the movie. Yeah, Sam Jackson's arm. <laughs> you know what I read is that there's like a Jurassic Park collector who owns that, the Ray Arnold's arm. <laughs> and he's like, he shows you all his toys and whatever. And then finally, if he likes you, he's like, do you want to see it? Yeah. Well, well. And by the <laughs> way, what's interesting is they had actually also there's uh, she was also supposed to find his leg. And if you huh. notice, she's limping right now because she was supposed to trip over his leg oh, and interesting. injure her leg. And that's why she's limping. Huh. You never, I, I've never questioned it. Yeah. Oh, so I was wrong, actually. So so Muldoon dies after we see the raptor with Ellie. I, I, oh, right, I, right, right, right. I flipped right. the order. But, but again, he gets one of the great lines. Clever girl. Clever girl. Another, another, another line that's lived on. Yeah. I just got to point out, too, because this is the place to do it. But I, I love that that shot when she has that moment behind the fence and she thinks everything's okay. Ellie back down in the bunker. And then the arm lands on her. And we think everything's okay. Pull out. It's a severed arm. And then the camera kind of follows her as she leans back on the fence. And then, boom, same shot. Raptor jumps up into the fence. I mean, yeah. that's how you do tension. It's just It ratchets it up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, There's right something here. to be said about this. not cutting. Look at it. Can you imagine that? Like, no. imagine that's the last thing you see. I know. Jeez. So technically, like I said, we don't see Muldoon die. So if if part two was like here he is and he's severely wounded, and and his arm is like a, a rocket launcher now, I'd be like, oh okay. Well. <laughs> I would totally. Be fine. Or if ever, I mean, obviously this wasn't his fate, but if like he was eaten by a T Rex, and then eventually you just see the T Rex like. Ugh, ugh. Ugh, and then fall to the ground and then a arm punched through its stomach i'd be like yeah yeah i'll buy that okay <laughs> <laughs> well it was muldoon so yeah it's like yeah come on guys yeah but yeah so so people say like oh you know grant is not an interesting character i disagree with that i think i think he's given a really compelling and interesting arc because i agree here's the man who does not like children. We see that in the very first scene, how that friggin' kid, future Chris Pratt in my head canon, uh, <laughs> is, is obnoxious. And then now he's in a position where he has to put, he, he's literally risking his life to protect children. That's great. Come on. Yeah. You know? And like this whole little, the uh, big Tim, the human piece of toast. That's great. You know, that's a very fatherly. It's very cute. It's, it, that's exactly right. You know, and, and it's like I said before, you watch the movie as a kid and you're like, he's who I want to be. Uh, trapped on this island with yeah you know yeah and that's a great also uh, after that whole cpr scene with tim and you're like thinking this little boy's gonna die and then when he comes back and goes three yeah <laughs> that's a great little button on that scene i also like uh in in a second here when we yeah when when ellie sees alan she's just like run yeah run. yeah she's like, still in the middle of the action sequence yeah This is great. Oh, Again, funny about just, leg. I never thought about that. We're, we're, yeah, that's that, that. I didn't realize that either. And I, I need to give props here. Actually, there's a YouTube channel by a gentleman named Clayton Fioriti, who it is a YouTube channel devoted entirely to Jurassic Park. Hmm. So for the past two weeks, I've been mainlining these little videos where he gets into various bits of canon and continuity and everything else. Because, because again, my kids are just loving this stuff. And and a lot of the stuff that I've mentioned in this track uh, comes from the things that that uh, he has said in his videos, hmm. uh, little bits of of history, like the thing about Ray Arnold's arm and leg and stuff. I mean, I didn't know that, you know. Yeah. Uh, really fascinating, and that and again that that drives home to me how even more than us, the people younger than us who watch these movies, just took them on as you know again I, I use this example but uh for them it was their star wars yeah you know yeah this i mean is for, great as, too with the... for as much fun as you and i are having watching this and for as much affection as we have for it like there are people who love these movies far more than we do yeah and i get it yeah i get it 
Yeah. Well, we just we we had that that lint or uh, that important film first. Exactly. So this just became another film we loved. But for them, this was the first. This was it. Yeah. You yeah. know. And that's that's honestly uh, uh, what it is for my for my oldest. As I, as I've said, you know, uh, he got to experience it on the big screen at a very formative stage. And he always compares movies to Jurassic Park. He's like, it's good, but it's not Jurassic Park good. <laughs> I love that. You know. This is great too. The the whole practical thing where oh it just happened, but with the raptor sort of snorting on that window to the kitchen. Yeah, and and the reason for like, that uh, is that is that as originally written, uh, they had these uh, uh, lizard tongues that went mm. and and uh, what uh, the advisors said is like, well, raptors didn't didn't have tongues like that, hmm. and so what they came up with instead was the snorting. Uh, and and you you know you the humidity into the the window and you see that yeah and it's so much more effective. And this you uh, this is this is probably my favorite. This is a masterpiece of tension. And again, I've talked before about how my kid was like climbing over the seat. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I was watching him more than I was watching the movie because he was shitting his pants. I'm pretty sure. I I believe it. And again. One location, just utilizing everything in that location. Every and, possible thing. And I keep love, moving around. Look at that. Look at the, the, the claw kind of clacking the floor. Yep. And how freaking terrifying it is. And and there's really only one shot in this whole sequence that has digital raptors in it. And it's it's there, right there. But then when they jump on the, 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 mm. the counter. Other than that, it's all just, uh, you know, it's the models. It blends really well. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. yeah. So r- right there, and then when it when it like jumps up. Yeah, and of course, because Spielberg is a master of geography, we don't cut. We see them crawl, and then we pan up, so we know how far away the dinosaurs are. <laughs> That's brilliant. And of Gosh. course, coming up here, one of the most greatest fake outs ever. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Where Lex is getting into the little cubby. Yeah, I remember completely uh tracking with this too when I first saw it. Oh yeah, it's yeah, so right here the dinosaur sees her getting into the thing and we're like, yeah. "Oh my gosh." I mean, it's this is brilliant. Look at this. Oh it's no, pretty- so this is right there right here is where my kid was just freaking out. <laughs> brilliant they sell that really well too her reflection on that oh it's 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 perfect cabinet or whatever and this too i always think this is like one of those things from a nightmare when the kid's running and there's that soap on the ground right you know where you like can't run fast enough it's yeah like that feeling yeah exactly look at that oh my gosh look at that through the dinosaur's legs it's so perfect Ugh. yeah this here here we go <laughs> <laughs> Man, they don't That's, make movies for kids like this anymore. They really don't, you know? It's it's uh, Well, I mean, I guess they're trying with the new Jurassic uh, World movies. That's well, actually, they're literally trying to make movies like this for kids. <laughs> I'll shut up. <laughs> I mean, maybe I just don't appreciate maybe because I'm not a kid anymore. I mean, it's that's that's the they're thing. They're not going to cement themselves with me the way that this did. That's the thing is, is I always for all the criticism people have for Jurassic World, which I I don't disagree with, with all of it, but I'm just like you know, it's not aimed at 40 year old you. It's aimed at 10 year old you. You know, that's that's very true. That jolt cola can on uh, Nedry's desk. Remember that? There's a there's a time capsule. Yeah. So, so here's my kid's Lego set right here. <laughs> I'm, I'm again, uh, Brian. I'm telling you, I'm like, it's an Alan Grant Lego. Who, who would have thought? Like, what a world we live in. Yeah? <laughs> I know, I know. It's pretty funny. They're like just like begging us not to grow up. Yeah, exactly. I love her. She's like, I can do this. It's a Unix system. Remember, I understood CD-ROMs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I don't even care. This, this is definitely the the one part of the movie that, like, more than dinosaurs coming back, this strains credibility that this little girl knows, like, computer programming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, the, little, you can roll your kid. eyes. Let, or you let me, can just let me, have fun actually, with it. hold on, Brian. Yeah. This little kid, not little girl. <laughs> not that she's a girl. She's no, no, no. Oh, I didn't even, yeah, no, I understood what you meant. <laughs> age, age. 
<laughs> age, not gender. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they've been aged down, right? Aren't the kids? I think their kids' is aged are ages are reversed. In they, the they're book? reversed. Like, so in the yeah. book, uh, Tim is the older brother, and Lex is the younger sister. And I think it's actually very smart the way they flipped it, um, because I, I think I think. Um, I don't know. I, th- I think having Lex be a little bit older and she's the protective big sister, I think it adds more dimension to her character. Yeah, I agree. But that's funny because as dated also as that looks, you yes. know, the computer graphics we're seeing, I remember as a kid that, that being a nail biter, this John Williams insane music oh, yeah. with this really slow moving program. And it was so simplified where it's like, get to this box. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it completely worked. I totally agree. Yeah. I like this here. Mr. Hammond, call the damn helicopters. <laughs> the phones are working. <laughs> Send the damn helicopters. But yeah. again, it's just like, you know, okay, now we, we're out of this, but now this, you know? And yep. now this, and now this, you know? And I think it, it, it's, it, all, it all tracks. It doesn't feel like you're going through an amusement park. I mean, even though literally that's what the movie is. But I mean, you know... It's not like set piece, set piece, set piece. It feels yes. we're following the the progression of events. Logical action. Yeah. You're right. Because okay, yeah. now we're here, but now we got to get from here to there. Well, that makes sense. And now we got to get from there to there. Well, that still makes sense. You know, that's a great you shot know, right there with the was, the reflection on the dinosaur. I was just gonna say, you know, it doesn't make sense <laughs> having that stuff projected on the dinosaur. Not at all. But it looks friggin' awesome. Yeah. It. It. it yeah, absolutely. It's. It's a pure. There's. There's a few moments of pure like Spielbergian fancy. Oh, by the way, right here, this shot here where Lex looks up. That's the yeah. one of the first instances of digital face replacement. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because because originally the stunt woman was looking up and it was very apparently not, you know, thirteen year old Ariana Richards. Yeah. I wonder too, there's something very impressionistic about after, you know, Hammond it, w- with them on the phone and then they're like, it's coming through the glass. And we just see broken glass, yeah. gun on the floor, foot on a ladder. I wonder if that was what the decisions behind that mm, were. That's interesting. I don't know. It totally works. I mean, it would almost be overkill if it, you just kept, you know, like you need them to get to the next place. So let's just get there, but do it in sort of an impressionistic way. Yeah. Now, now you know, as as we sort of wind down here, it's interesting how they changed the ending of this movie based on Spielberg's sort of fancy of like, no, we need to see the T-Rex again. He was, of course, 100% right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is sort of a trend with Jurassic movies, which is that they sort of scrap the original ending and just come up with something different. I don't know about Jurassic World, but certainly the original three, each really? of them had a different ending than the one that that ended up making it. Uh, to the screen. Huh. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, so the original plan here, uh, which you do know, I'm sure was that, uh, the, 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 it was supposed to be the, the various raptors basically get impaled by the bones of all the, the old dinosaurs mm-hmm. and, and that's it. And that's the end. And you can see how that feels kind of anticlimactic. Right. Uh, so instead it was, well, let's let's have again one of the biggest stars of the movie re-enter right there, and then mm-hmm. the, the the John Williams movie music triumphantly comes in. Now, what's very funny is that Spielberg came up with that at the tail end, and he's like, you know, why don't we have the 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 T Rex come into the visitor center, and and uh, you know the uh, the people who were designing it were like, where does he come from? It's like, oh well, he'll he'll come in the shot like this, and what they meant was, well, no, how does he fit in? Like, where how does he get in? Oh. <laughs> You know, but uh, yeah. you never think about it, really. Nope, never thought about it. You know, it's like, I don't know, life found a way. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. I can't believe I've never thought about that. That'd be funny if like every, like, you know how Homer in that, that, that submarine episode, it's my first day. And that's like his excuse for everything. Yeah. Like, <laughs> any issue, Spielberg's just like, uh, life found a way. You know? Yeah, right. Now look at that shot right there. Oh. Yeah. So, so that banner again. I talk about Jurassic World. Like they see the banner, and then they the kids use it to like light a torch. And and uh, Hamza, my oldest, he's like, when we watched the movie, when we watched Jurassic World a few years ago, he's like, that's the banner, that's the banner, you know. Uh, that's so great. 
So originally Hammond is is out out he doesn't make it this far. He's like while while the characters are trying to escape, he's sort of pondering, you know, how things went awry and then the T-Rex reemerges and he runs away from the T-Rex and then he trips and falls into like a pit basically, at which point he encounters a bunch of compies who eat him to death. Hmm. So again, that they used his death scene for Peter Stramari in the second one. Um, I can see a version where you have him get eaten by his creation. Yes. I mean, that's not what I want in this version, but I, I can understand that being a decision. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, I don't think audiences would have liked that. No. You know, because because there is, there tends to be a sense of like, oh, so-and-so deserves this. The the one death, well, that's not true. I mean, obviously, because Ray Arnold and, and Muldoon are not like that. But, but I think Hammond... Hammond is just too lovable. Yeah. You even feel for him at that moment where he's getting in the helicopter, but he has to look back one more time. Yeah. Let, let me rephrase. I think the more ignominious your death is, it has to be deserved. Right. And Right, right, right. You know, like like Muldoon sort of dies in action and Ray Arnold is like out there trying to save them and he died, right? But Hammond dies in this sort of pathetic way. I don't think, I don't think anybody, maybe Sean Connery. But, sure, sure. Oh, yeah, he would have had to have been doing something to help. Yeah, but you know, but I think I think Richard Attenborough wouldn't have worked. Nah, nah. Now now this this uh, this ending with the, with the birds flying away is mirrored at the end of the third Jurassic Park, where it's uh, pterodactyls flying away. Oh, see, I don't remember that. The only thing I remember about the third one is that hello, Alan, the dinosaur that <laughs> the, the, the dream so that he dream. has. Yeah, which which I, okay, I'm not going to defend that, but there's a story reason for that in the movie, which is that you know earlier in the movie he's at Ellie Sattler's house and he there's a parrot that he and Ellie used to mm. used to, and he's like, can you say Alan? Can you say Alan? And and he doesn't say anything. He's like, he used to say my name, and then he has a dream where there's a raptor saying his name because. Uh, so, I see. I don't even. I'd have to. Read I mean, it. again, I'm not defending it. I'm not like that neat. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But, but it's it's you know you know what's funny is that the Jurassic movies for me the Jurassic sequel certainly, I, I look at Jurassic Park like I do Planet of the Apes. To me, it's like a perfect first movie, and a bunch of pretty good sequels. Sure. Sure. You know, as opposed to like RoboCop, which is a perfect first movie and garbage sequels. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So there's, the, I draw a distinction. To me, every Jurassic movie I've liked. Uh, yeah. And, and part of it is because, well, I'm, I know going and I'm never going to re-experience the magic of that first movie. And I know it. And that's fine. If I want to experience that, I'll watch the first movie and I'll always feel that again. So with the sequels, I'm like, just give me people getting chased by slash eaten by dinosaurs, and I'm I'm happy. And that makes sense, because when you have a, a trilogy, like a Star Wars trilogy, like they're all connected. Yes. So they do all have to equal each other. Yeah. But with this, it's like just another adventure in a world you like. Yeah, and, and Spielberg has said as much. He's like, look, The Lost World is the first sequel I ever made. Right. Uh, because he's like, I don't consider the Indiana Jones movies sequels. Those are separate adventures with this character. Mm -hmm. whereas the lost world is is a continuation but it's carrying the story in a different direction and it's you know it's it's doing different things like that says why spielberg wanted to remain involved with these movies you know Mm -hmm. uh and he he said previously like i i i regretted sort of walking away or not being involved with the with the jaws movies right because obviously the problem with jaws is that it's a part of this really garbage franchise. Right, right, this, right, right. It's this amazing movie uh, that is, you know, that is one of four movies of, of really variable quality. And I think I think with, with Jurassic, he's like, well, I'm not going to let that happen again, you know? Yeah. Uh, and he has remained involved throughout. I mean, even even these, these new movies, it's like he has to sign off on everything. Mm-hmm. And so it is near and dear to him. Uh, and it's easy to see why. Yeah. You know. Also, we we do have to point out the the credit that became a meme. Yes. The dinosaur supervisor Phil Tippett, <laughs> and then it became you had one job, Phil. People died, Phil. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so so Jurassic Park twenty five years later. What do you think, man? I I just love this movie. I I was having a hard time doing this commentary because I kept 
sort of battling with wanting to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. Is this is yeah, in many ways this is one of the hardest commentaries we've ever had to do not because we lacked for things to say, uh but yeah, like you said because it's just you, you do get really drawn in. Uh, oh yeah, if if we were to stop now and then I were to start this over with the sound on, I could easily sit here now for another 2 hours and watch it. Yeah, you're not yeah. kidding. You know, now, now I'll tell you, I said this at the start and, and I absolutely mean it. Uh, I, I'm going to force you to sit down with me one day and do a lost world commentary track. Uh, I'm into it. I'm into it. I, uh, I, I would have to watch it. I'd have to revisit it, but yeah, that'd be fun. Well, the, the, this job uh, forces many hardships on you, Brian. (laughs) You have to watch the Steven Spielberg movie. You haven't seen that much. (laughs) Sorry, man. I got to say, actually, because I was thinking about all the things I had to do today. I was like, okay, I got to do this commentary at this time and da 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 da. And it was feeling like a task. And I was <laughs> like, what? Like sitting down with my best bud and watching a movie I love? That, that That's like not a task. That's like a reward. Yeah, that's true. There's yeah. worse ways to start your weekend, right? Yeah. No, this is fantastic. <laughs> but no, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a movie that uh, I really, I, I, I say this now as a parent, and I, I get to experience it through my kids' eyes. And I, I know I've mentioned this throughout, and I hope people aren't getting sick of me leaning into that, but I really do think it's an important part of understanding the appeal of this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I experienced it as a kid, and, and here we are a quarter century later, and it still works. That's uh, Look, that's not something a lot most movies uh, are able to say. No, it works. No, you're you're right. It it because not only does it work, it works without you having to sort of put your nostalgia blinkers on. Yep. Yep. Yeah, like it works without being like, well, all right. Well, I guess you just ignore that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. It you know, if you told me this movie came out a year ago, I would believe you. Mm-hmm. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, when they when they put it back out for 3D, like we'd mentioned a couple years ago, Dan and I went and saw it, and it was just as, you know magical as an adult sitting and watching it in a theater i I, honestly i think we even joked when we came out we're like i could do that one more time before it leaves theaters (laughs) i mean it just has that weird magic that spell well hopefully our commentary track has spurred you into revisiting it one more time if you have not watched it uh, along with the movie uh this is this is a true evergreen and uh, as you could tell from from listening to us it's it's something uh that's near and dear to both of us so thank you so much everybody for listening uh this was a blast uh, for me to do and and hopefully it was a blast for you to listen to absolutely so as we wrap things up, Brian, this is uh, the uh, one more commentary track in a busy year of commentaries for us. We have <laughs> it, the the dam is practically bursting with with commentaries coming up. So uh, we have a fun one uh, planned uh, for uh, later in the week. So uh, I, I won't say what that is, but you will know if you subscribe to the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta tease you. We gotta we gotta tease you the way Spielberg does, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, 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 Brian, of course, writes for Puppy Dog Pals uh, on on Disney Junior. So please do check that out if uh, you're interested in more of his work. He's also on Twitter. Everybody, everything Brian. I know I haven't like hit on the Twitter thing in a while, but uh, he is very funny, and I feel like the more followers he gets, the more likely he is to occasionally post something so if you're listening to this and you're interested in contacting brian on twitter you know what i don't care if he doesn't use it much add him anyway he's (laughs) he's worth it oh thanks zach and as for me uh, you can find me at my website zackyscorner.com that's z-a-k-i-s corner that's also my twitter that's also my instagram uh also you can email us at moviefilmpodcast at gmail.com you can also hit like on our facebook page facebook.com slash moviefilmpodcast you can also go to itunes and leave a review leave a star rating every little bit helps Uh, i see that we have a couple of new reviews that i will be reading on our regular show so thank you for uh those of you who've done that and uh, with that i'm gonna put a pin in this commentary we will not be back in 65 million years it'll be much sooner than that (laughs) and uh, our next regular show will be talking about Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom so look forward to that thank you everybody for listening catch you next time
As the chief buffet officer here at Pizza Ranch, I get all kinds of questions from guests. Here's one from Emma. So, what's your favorite number? That's easy, Emma. My favorite number is 14,839,552. With Buffet Your Way, you can order any pizza you want and we'll bake it and make sure you get the first slice. And with all our crust, sauces, and toppings, we can make you 14,839,552 different pizzas. Just not, you know, all at the same time. Pizza Ranch, everyone's favorite buffet. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.